Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, my Karen neighbor demands I make my baby stop crying. I'm the father of a one-year-old toddler. Recently, she started teething as her molars have started to come in. First, it was the top ones for about a week. Then we had a week's break, and now the bottom ones are coming in. It's clearly causing my daughter a lot of pain, especially at night. Before, she was a good sleeper, but now it's been rough. She's been waking up around 1 a.m. and then 3 a.m. daily, screaming with our little fingers in her mouth. My wife and I have tried comforting her, bringing her in our bed. She sleeps in our room anyway, and her crib is next to our bed, but normally she likes to sleep cuddled up when she's uncomfortable. We've even given her baby Motrin to help her with the pain, but she still screams for about 10 to 20 minutes each time until we're able to settle her down. It's shrill and it sucks, but there's not much we can do beyond what we're already doing. We live on the ground floor of a new condo building. It's made of heavy concrete and decently soundproofed, but it's not perfect. Above us lives a single woman in her late 20s, early 30s. This is an expensive part of town in a new building, so we can assume she's decently moneyed. She also keeps her balcony door open all day and night, and it faces directly into our courtyard. She's been punishing us during the day by blasting loud music directly into our unit by putting a stereo next to her balcony. We're on the ground floor and we have a fully enclosed courtyard so it vibrates around. She's got great music taste and my daughter will just dance to it all day long. So while my wife hates her intention, I think it's worked out just fine. Until now. Last night she came barging down at 3am and rang our bell four times while we were trying to settle our daughter. Motrin works for about 8 hours so by 3am we have to give her another dose and wait through the cries, cradling her for 15-20 to 20 minutes for it to kick in again. My wife, a strong-tempered petite woman, amplified by her first year of motherhood, wanted to go fight her then and there. But I said, let's just concentrate on settling the baby and ignore her. I also didn't want to make the baby any more upset than she already was. So yeah, I just let her fume outside my door at 3 a.m. Am I the jerk? Update. I delivered a small care package to her door with a long letter and a bottle of wine and chocolates. But your neighbor treated you like that and you gave her wine and chocolates? Bruh. She was not home, so I put it next to her door. We're only here for a couple of months, temporary rental until we finish construction, but I'd rather offer an olive branch than see all the pettiness continue. Yes, it sucks to be woken up. Yes, it's a shared building. Yes, people throw parties here until 3 a.m. on the weekends. Yes, babies cry and we try our best. For those who live in very big cities, mine has 22 million, this is what you experience. I'm listening to loud mariachi music from the neighbor across the way right now. Everyone sucks here. Your comments about her are awful, especially that daddy is paying her way. Her response with the loud music is childish. Is there some reason why you can't move the doses of Motrin so that it works all night? Maybe a dose at 11pm. That would allow all of you to get a much needed night's sleep. Also, I think they make cold teething rings to help with pain. Try harder for you, your kid, and your neighbor. Also, go to a doctor. How is the baby screaming loud enough to disrupt someone else's life in a, from his words, pretty soundproof building? And doctors tell you to stay ahead of the pain. They shouldn't wait until the kid is screaming to finally give her pain meds. They know she's teething. Why are they letting her reach that level of agony? Info. About giving her dose later at night. You mean there's another way than waking up the building at 3 a.m. every single night? Also, good job at deleting the daddy line, which was causing you to gain some of the you're the jerk judgments. The daddy line is still in the auto mod comment for those who want to see it. OP is the jerk for deleting it to make him sound like less of a jerk. I felt like OP used some pretty harsh and leading words to describe the neighbor, even after OP removed the daddy line. You're the jerk, and I have four kids. I shared a wall with college students when I had babies, so I have first-hand experience with the music versus baby conflicts. OP needs to extend an olive branch to all direct neighbors, box of muffins or a gift card from a local coffee place with a note apologizing for the nighttime baby noise. Maybe a comment about loving her taste in music during the day for this, the neighbor bangs on his door in the middle of the night and y'all really think he should give her gifts? Bruh. Bruh. Stop it Reddit boy, remember your blood pressure. No, someone comes banging on my door at 3am, I'm not gonna give them gifts, I'm gonna kick their- Stop it Reddit boy, stop it. I can't, I... Don't do it, Reddit boy.
Reddit boy, you have ascended. It feels so good to fight. <laughs> A lawyer's pro-revenge on the fraudster who stole all his money. A while back, I got suckered by a fraudster and I lost our life savings. This is the story of how I got suckered and how I got my money back, with interest. Why do you want to move our money? My wife said. Mega Bank does a pretty good job at managing it. Each month, my wife took our surplus income and dumped it into our retirement plan and other investments, and for years it had been growing. It had started out as a nest egg, but now it was actual money real money. Not enough to retire on, but a great start. Mega Bank is just hugging the index, I said. I was parroting a phrase I'd heard from a fast-talking fraudster who had given a seminar for the local bar association. My wife asked what it meant, and I explained. Mega Bank is basically just buying the index and charging us for the privilege. We could do the same thing they are, but without paying them a percentage. Then why don't we just do that? Let's exit the Mega Bank mutual fund and buy the index. That way our money is safe. I shook my head. We can do way better. The fraudster seminar had lasted barely an hour, but now I was an expert on the stock market. Look, a bunch of guys from the local bar association are all joining in with this guy. He's got a great track record. Edward Lee Shore was the man's name, and he was an investing genius. His funds had made steady returns above market for years. I showed my wife the glossy brochure I'd picked up at the seminar that morning. She took it from me and flipped through it. If he promised crazy high returns, then I'd know he was shady, but that's not what he's promising, she said. Just good steady returns. Exactly. He's got this new thing he buys called principal protected notes, and that means you can't lose your principal. Really? My trusting wife said, and I told her, yes, really, and talked her into transferring all our funds to the genius investors company, Lee Shore Investments. People reading this are going to say that I should have known this was BS right from the start, and maybe they're right. But the thing is, I didn't come for money, and when it came to finance, my BS detector wasn't very well calibrated. In the middle class home I grew up in, money was for spending. Sure, my parents saved, sort of, but for the most part, money was for spending. And so when I reached my 30s and found to my surprise that I had surplus income, I didn't know what to do with it. I had no notion, no idea at all, until I met Edward Lee Shore, the genius investor, the man who told me what to do with my money. So my wife gave me her okay, and a guy from Lee Shore Investments came by our house with papers, a pen, and glib talk. My wife and I signed these papers here and there, next to the little blue X's, over and over again. And while we signed, the man talked. And when he finished talking, and when we finished signing, he left. He didn't leave any copies, my wife said. I guess he'll send them to us in the mail, I said. But the man had left one piece of paper, a little blurb about the awesomeness of Lee Shore Investments, and how their money was all in accounts with Mega Bank invested in principal protected notes, and so their client's money was doubly secure, financially invincible. The blurb included the company's website, and the fast-talking sales guy had walked me through setting up our username and password. We'll be able to monitor our investments real-time, I said to my wife. Mega Bank never offered that. With them, we had to wait for the monthly statement. But now, I'm going to check out our balance every day, and if we aren't making the money that they promised, I'll let you know right away. I kept the first part of that promise, and that's the only reason I got our money back. As for the second, my wife and I disagree on whether I kept that part of the bargain. The main branch of Mega Bank was downtown, taking up the entire ground floor of the same building where I worked on the 15th floor. I walked through Main Branch almost every day on my way to court and back. The windows of Main Branch and the entire building were coated with layers of precious metal. On cloudy days, the tower looked like it was silver, and when it rained, copper. But on good days, the tower gleamed golden. And on those days, which were most days, Mega Bank reigned supreme over the financial sector. A couple of days after we gave our money to Lee Shore Investments, I was walking through Main Branch. Main Branch was as big inside as a cathedral, and I felt like I was in a church that was dedicated to money. I had no business at Mega Bank that day. No deposits to make, nothing to do, but I heard a voice call my name, and I turned. How's it going, OP? A voice said. It was the floor's senior financial advisor, a woman close to retirement. Mega Bank had her on a high-profile desk, the one for servicing local professionals, mostly lawyers. Not bad, not bad, I said. Sorry to see your money's leaving us, the advisor said. Lee Shore Investments had acted fast after I signed the papers, and I was pleased to see that the transfer was underway. 
I explained that, technically speaking, the money wasn't actually leaving Mega Bank, that I was merely switching financial managers, that's all. Lee Shore banks with you guys, I said. Their office is upstairs, just like mine. It's not quite the same, the advisor said, explaining that if a mega bank broker messed up, the bank was there to answer for it. But if Lee Shore lost my money, I'd be without recourse. I know you know this, the advisor said, and I've made this speech to a bunch of our lawyer clients over the last while, people like you who are moving their money to Lee Shore. But I have to say it, just a little warning, that's all. I made polite thank you noises, accompanied by a little nod. And you can always come back, you know, the advisor said. We never say no to money. I thanked her again and walked on to the elevator banks, and a few minutes later I was at my desk, logging into Lee Shore's website, using the credentials that the fast-talking sales guy had left behind after his visit. I could see all my investments online on Lee Shore's website. There were six facilities invested in various things. The balances for all six accounts fluctuated slightly right before my eyes, and next to them was a box showing green for positive, red for negative. Four were green, two were red, but only slightly, and already the fun had earned a small gain. Nothing spectacular, but a gain. That night, my wife and I checked the Lee Shores website again and saw that they had finished the day up almost a third of a point. Not bad, on a day when the market was flat. The next day I was coming back from court and was walking through main branch of Mega Bank. Although I had moved my investments, I was still a customer. Mega Bank had my firm's trust and general accounts, and my staff and I popped in and out occasionally to do this and that. The financial advisor spotted me and called me over. Sorry about the delay with one of your funds, she said. What delay? Your wife didn't sign one of the forms, she said, passing it over the counter. It was one of the Lee Shore investment transfer forms that the fast-talking money guy had placed before us for signature. I looked at it, and saw that like the advisor said, my wife had missed one of the signatures. So where's the money, I said. Still with us. Just get your wife's signature and we'll move it over right away. I took the form with me and headed up to my office. With a coffee in hand, I closed my office door and turned on my monitor. After a few clicks, I was back on the website of Lee Shore Investments, looking at how my life savings were doing. I could see that the market was down, but my money with Lee Shore was holding its own treading water in the unsteady market, keeping its place. I looked at the facilities, all six of them, and wondered how all six facilities could be performing well when one of the facilities had not been transferred. It didn't make any sense. Mega Bank had sent Lee Shore only five of my funds, yet Lee Shore recorded all six being in their hands. The proof was right on my screen. A few minutes later, I was back downstairs at Mega Bank, an advisor's office, and we looked at her screen. The sixth fund is still with us, she said, pointing at her screen, and I looked where she pointed, and she was right. Five of the accounts were gone, but one remained, a joint investment account, the one that my wife had forgotten to sign off on. This doesn't make any sense, I said. The advisor agreed that it made no sense. There must be some explanation, I said, and the advisor suggested that I call Lee Shore. I used her desk phone, and when I called Lee Shore's office, the receptionist put me right through to Edward Lee Shore himself. I explained that I was with my old advisor and that I had a question. I explained the problem. Oh, that, he said. Sure, that happens sometimes. I would have mentioned it to you myself, but Megabank was late telling us that the transfer didn't go through. But why does it show on your system that my money is there? Why can we see it on the screen? Edward Lee Shore explained it to me. Something about margin and leverage and money transfer protocols and wires and ETFs and making sure the customer was covered. It's all about customer service, making sure our people are taken care of, even when Megabank drops the ball, he said, adding that I was a valued customer and he wouldn't be charging me any extra fees for making sure I was in the market while we waited for Megabank to hand over the money. Thanks, I said, and put down the phone. I hadn't understood a word that he said. I looked across at the advisor. She had been in the business for decades and she would be able to translate what Edward Lee Shore had just told me. That was just a bunch of money words, she said. I couldn't make heads or tails out of it. I didn't like that. I didn't like that at all. I'd felt a chill in my office a few minutes earlier, but that was nothing compared to what I was feeling now. Can you transfer the money back to me? I said. No, the advisor said. The money is with Lee Shore now, and we need their consent to move it. Thanks, I said. I left her office, walking fast, then really fast, and when I reached the elevators, I pounded the up button until a door opened, and then I hammered the button for the 15th floor so far that my hand hurt. Cancel my appointments, I said to my senior secretary as I passed by her desk. 
I shut the door to my office and sat at my desk, my head in my hands. Lee Shore's website was on my screen, showing my balances, but I didn't trust those balances anymore. One of them was obviously completely fictitious, showing the performance of an investment that had yet to reach Lee Shore's office. The balance on the sixth facility was BS, and if it was BS, so were the others. Edward Lee Shore had defrauded me. He had done it easily, almost without effort. He had opened his mouth, and after listening to him blah 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 for an hour, I'd gone home and persuaded my wife to give him everything we'd saved. Now we had almost nothing, and it was 100% my fault. My face burned with embarrassment and shame. First, for being taken like an ignorant guy, and second, because I did not know what to tell my wife. We had only one account of six left, and a small one at that. I'd lost almost everything, and we'd be starting from financial scratch. You'd think that a lawyer would be able to figure out what to do. By this point, I'd been at the bar for close to a decade, and I knew my way around the courts. But I wasn't just the lawyer this time, I was the victim, and I did what most victims do. I panicked. Before I could properly consider the matter, I swung into action and started a series of maneuvers intended to fix things, but which only made it worse. What's up? Edward Lee Shore said when I called him for the second time that day. I explained that I had changed my mind, that my wife and I wanted our money back. I kept my voice very polite and under control. No can do, he said to me affably. It's a locked in fund, guaranteed for a year at least. You're a lawyer. You ought to read the fine print. I can't let you out. It would upset the balance of the fund. I don't know why I thought politeness would work, but it didn't, and I went to my default setting when things didn't go my way for something that matters to me. Listen, I said, I don't give a hoot about any of that. I really don't. You've had my money for all of five minutes, and I want it back now. He hung up on me, and when I went up a few floors to confront him personally, his office was locked. I banged on the door. I yelled. I raged. Then I heard a voice. Shore's voice, speaking to me from the other side of the door. You should have read the fine print, he said. Come see me in a year. That was my first move, to alert Edward Lee Shore that I was onto him. I made more mistakes that day, but letting Lee Shore know that I was onto him was the first and the biggest. Everything that happened after that flowed from that first mistake. I was still panicking, and I was thinking like a victim, like a client. What does any client do when they're desperate and need help right away? They hire a lawyer. I was in a tall downtown building filled with law firms and I went to the first one I could think of. The receptionist made me wait for 30 minutes while she called here and there, looking for a lawyer who was free. Finally, she found someone and I was taken to a small office where a lawyer greeted me. I explained the problem, the amounts involved, the urgency of immediate action. Well, the man said, you did agree to lock in the money for a year. You should have read the fine print. You can't prove fraud, so I don't see that you have much to go on. We talked back and forth for a while, but he was firm. There was no remedy. I'd have to wait the year that I had agreed to, and then I could ask for my money back. If he doesn't give it back to you then, feel free to return and we'll help you out. That was his advice, for which he charged $1,000. I left the lawyer's office feeling way worse than I had when I'd walked in. After falling for Lee Shore's huge fraud, I'd fallen for a law firm smaller one, paying good money for crappy legal advice. But I was still in client mode, so I went to another law firm in the same building. I went to reception, told them I had an emergency, and after a while, they took me to a lawyer's office. He was more senior than the first guy, corner office and all that, and his advice was more concrete. Mariva injunction all the way, he said. You give me the go-ahead and we'll have the papers filed within a day and we'll be in front of a judge within a week. A week, I said. Commercial litigation courts packed this week, two judges on vacation and another is in the hospital. A week's the best I can do. Okay, but how about an injunction of some kind, a court order to freeze the funds? I hadn't mentioned that I was a lawyer. I'd been too embarrassed to admit that. So I had to sit there and listen patiently as he explained there could be no execution before judgment, no judgment before there was a lawsuit, and no injunction until there was a motion, and no motion unless they could get a court date, which he could not, at least for a week. A week's plenty of time, unless your target knows you're coming. An hour earlier, I'd been outside Lee Shore's office, pounding on the door and screaming that I wanted my money right now. I don't think we have a week, I said. I headed back to my office, poorer by yet another thousand dollars. I sat at my desk, stunned. I pulled off my jacket and undid my tie, because I was sweating like I'd run a marathon on a hot day. I tried asking for my money back, and then I demanded it and screamed for it, but words hadn't worked. I needed more than words, 
I needed the court system to help me out, but the two lawyers I had consulted couldn't help me. You created this mess all on your own. You should have read the fine print. You messed up and you're going to have to fix it yourself. That's what I said to myself. And when I realized that I was all alone, that I had no one to turn to, my brain started to work once more. I went to our firm's small library and found Baldwin on banking. But after almost an hour, I gave up because Baldwin was missing a chapter on what to do after someone rips you off. So I tried the book on injunctions next, but that was useless. To get a court order to freeze a bank account, you needed a judge, and I couldn't get in front of a judge for a week. So I dithered in the library for another hour, looking at this, flipping through that, and then I retreated to my office. I was panicking again, really panicking now. I had painted myself into a corner and burned all of my bridges. My law degree and a decade of practice was useless, and I had no way to fight back against Edward Lee Shore. If I hadn't panicked, if I had remained calm, I would have hired a lawyer to do the Mariva thing. And unwarned, Edward Lee Shore would have been a sitting duck. I had blown the only thing I had going for me, the advantage of surprise. I get this nightmare sometimes, one that a lot of people get. Maybe you know the one I'm talking about, where you're back in school and you have an exam coming up and you haven't studied, you aren't prepared, you don't have time to catch up, but there's a 100% final the next day and you have one night to learn an entire course. In my dreams, I always woke up before I actually had to write that nightmare final exam, but this time it was real. I had maybe a day at most to do something and after that I would be finished. I picked up the phone and called my wife. I'm teaching, she said. You shouldn't call when I'm teaching. She was whispering and in the background I could hear rowdy teenagers doing their thing. I'm pulling an all-nighter, I said. What? I promised that I'd tell her all about it, then I hung up. Then I went online and started to research. It was time to start studying for tomorrow's final, a 100% final, where you either scored perfect or you failed. I'd either find a way to stop Edward Lee Shore or I'd go back home to tell my wife that I'd lost everything we had saved. By midnight, I was starting to get punchy. I had had more coffee than ever before. I was slouched over my desk trying to find new sources, a new idea. I flipped through Baldwin on banking again and the Canadian Encyclopedic Digest. I tried every combination of search terms I could think of on Quick Law, pulled up every case, scanned every headnote, but I found nothing. A little after midnight, my nightmare entered the truly desperate phase. With the textbooks and case law and all secondary sources proving totally useless, I had reached my last resort. I was reading statutes. In my area of practice, federal statutes aren't really a thing. I practice in areas under provincial jurisdiction, whereas banks are federally regulated. But in my desperation, I thought I'd try reading the Bank Act. Maybe I'd find something there. So I clicked on a link and waited for the Bank Act PDF to download. Hurry up, I told our server, when the statute took too long to appear on the screen. But I soon realized that the server wasn't the problem, it was the statute itself. When the Bank Act finally finished downloading, I saw that it was massive, almost a thousand sections, and many of those sections were themselves big enough to be entire statutes all on their own. I had never seen a statute that big. Gotta start somewhere, I said, as my eyes scanned the opening sections, and I started to read. I read and I read and I read some more, and I drank coffee and made notes. Earlier that evening, I'd spoken with my wife and traded some texts with her. She had asked me to come home, saying that whatever it was I was working on, it wouldn't look so bad if I got a good night's sleep. And while normally she would be right, this time she was wrong. So I kept on reading and mouse clicking and note taking and coffee drinking. And by 2 a.m., I was barely halfway through the Bank Act when I paused. I was reading an obscure Bank Act provision about unclaimed balances, but my brain couldn't focus. I was starting to fade out now because it's not so easy to pull an all-nighter when you're pushing 40. All-nighters are for kids, and I wasn't a kid. But there was at least a small part of my brain that was still awake, still paying attention, and it gave me a little poke and told me to reread the paragraph that I'd blown past a minute before. I went back and read the provision again, and again. The wording was obscure and convoluted. It hardly made any sense at all. I read the clause again and again. Its words strange and almost cryptic. The words seemed to be creating a right, but doing it not with positive words, but instead using language of negation. No wonder I'd missed it the first time. The clause was terribly drafted. Really, my law brain said. If I were drafting that clause, I'd just say straight out that... And then I jumped out of my seat and whooped. The office was empty. Not even articling students work until 2 in the morning. I whooped again, but then told myself to calm down. I reminded myself that it was early morning, that I'd had no sleep, 
that I had no idea what I was doing and that I was desperate. So I did a search on the Bank Act provision that I had hoped was my salvation to see if the wording had ever been cited. Surely if someone had used it before for what I wanted to use it, I'd find cases all over the place. I cut and pasted the statute section into Quick Law, I pressed enter, and nothing. Not a thing. The phrase had never been considered by a judge. There was no record of anyone interpreting the section of the Bank Act that I was hoping would save me, and my burst of enthusiasm disappeared. The brief instant of hope had energized me, and when hope faded, my remaining energy faded with it. Got no choice, I said to myself as I pulled up a document and started typing. You've already lost all your money. Might as well embarrass yourself as well. So I typed and I drafted and deleted and retyped, and when I finished, there was a statement of claim on my screen, the opening salvo of a lawsuit. It wasn't much, but it was the best I could do. I got some sleep on the couch in my office, and I didn't wake up until almost 8.30. I ran downstairs to the building's gym for a quick shower. I tried to make myself look decent, but I was in a rush. I needed to get my claim issued right at 9.30 if I was going to have a chance. But when I got there, a long line of process servers awaited me. Is it always like this? I said to our firm's process server. He was 20 places back in line. You have no idea, he said. He told me to leave it with him and he'd probably get it issued by the end of the day, but I wasn't waiting. I walked to the front of the line and opened my wallet. I got a claim that I need issued right now and I'm paying extra to jump the line. First one who says they'll help gets a bonus. I started pulling bills from my wallet in full view of the people near the front of the line. I held a wad of bills over my head, waving them, and the process server at the front of the line said, I'll do it. When the court opened a few minutes later, my claim got issued first. It had cost me close to $200, but I didn't care. I took my issued claim and headed off at a run. I had to get to main branch of Megabank. Every second counted, and a few minutes later I arrived. By now it was 9.45, and many of the counters were open. There were already long lines, and I half walked, half ran through the branch, looking for a counter with no lineup. But everything was busy. Everything was packed, and time was running out. What's wrong, OP? My former advisor called out to me from her desk. She was serving a customer, but she could see the distress on my face and took pity on me. I got a document I have to serve on right away, I said. And when I said those words, the advisor's customer turned around and looked at me. It was Edward Lee Shore of Lee Shore Investments himself. He had a briefcase with him and a suitcase. I brushed past him and gave the claim I was carrying to the advisor. I knew that I was probably wasting my time. Seeing Shore had put me back into full panic mode. He was on his way out, that much was obvious. I'd given him a day's notice and that's all he needed. I figured he had locked his office door for the last time and was making a final trip to Megabank to cash out, to take all his money with him. But I had a card to play, and maybe it was just a bluff, but I was going to play it anyway. I passed the claim to the advisor. I was here first, Edward Lee Shore said, but I ignored him. I'm, uh, serving the bank with this claim, I said, and I'm, uh, I'm claiming ownership of some funds on deposit. I had sued Edward Lee Shore and his company, Lee Shore Investments, and all the lawsuit said was that I was claiming ownership of money in his accounts. The claim had taken me hours to draft, but it was only two pages long. Give me my money, the claim said. Give me my money. I want my money. A ridiculous claim, really, and I felt embarrassed, but when I passed the papers to the advisor, she took them from me and began to read them over. I watched the advisor read over my paperwork. I'll be back, she said. I thought Shore would be angry that she had taken me ahead of him, but he wasn't, nor did he become angry when I gave him another copy of the claim and told him he was served. You're too late, he said. You can't do anything without a court order. You're a lawyer. You should know that. When she comes back, she's going to tell you to go away, and you know what she'll do next? She's going to send a wire persuading to my instructions. All your stunt has done is delay me five minutes. Shore did not try to hide his gloating smile of triumph. The advisor returned. Done, she said. What? I said. Done what? Shore said. We get claims like this now and again. I had to check with the assistant manager, but that's just protocol. It's done now. What's done? I said again, trying not to scream, desperate to know what it was she had done. I froze the accounts, she said. All my accounts? I said. All five? She shook her head and my heart sank and Shore smiled. But at the advisor's next words, his smile froze on his face. No, it doesn't work that way, she said. I can't freeze money in an account. We have to freeze all the accounts, everything. Shore looked at her, stunned. Then he turned to me. You can't freeze an account without a court order. You just can't. 
Now it was my turn to smile, and I said the words that I'd wanted to say since I first read them at 2 a.m. that morning. The words that I said were the most beautiful words I've ever spoken in my life. It's the only time I said them, but I will never forget these words. Your accounts are all frozen pursuant to subsection 432 sub 2 of the Bank Act, I said. Your accounts, all of them, are frozen by operation law. I froze the accounts automatically without a court order and they will remain frozen until you get a court order to unfreeze them. But there must be another way, Shore said. Yes, the advisor said. If the plaintiff consents, you can still operate your accounts, but only if the plaintiff consents. Shore turned to me. We have to talk, he said. Come to my office, I told him. We didn't talk for long. It was easy to reach a deal and we were both in a hurry. He had a wire to send and a plane to catch and I wanted my money on the spot. We typed up a letter to the bank, a letter of instructions. We both signed it and we went back downstairs to the same counter and waited in a short line for the advisor. I was feeling pretty good now. I'd solved the problem. Everything was settled. Shore, on the other hand, was sweating now. Sometimes his face was red, other times a sickly white. He had all his chips on the table now and he needed to cash out fast. Come on, come on, he muttered as a customer in front of us yacked away with the advisor, taking up valuable time. Finally, the customer went on her way and it was our turn. I presented the letter to the advisor, the letter that Shore and I had signed. The advisor took the letter from us and gave it a good and careful read. I'll be back, she said, leaving Shore and I standing together at her counter. We watched as she went into the assistant manager's office and when she didn't come out right away, Shore started fidgeting again. Why did you do it? I said. Do what? He said, snapping out of his funk and turning to me. Why did you steal from people? He explained that it was not stealing. People gave him their money voluntarily. He stole nothing. People came to him with their eyes wide open. He explained, and it wasn't his fault if they were gullible. The world was made for sharp guys like him. But you can't be that smart, I said. After all, I caught you, and now you're taking off, running to who knows where, before other people can catch on to you. I've been doing this for 30 years, and no one's caught me. You just got lucky. You're not smart, just lucky. The advisor returned. For a draft this size, it needs two signatures, she explained. She passed me an envelope, and when I looked inside it, I almost cried. It was not a mere check, but a bank draft, good as cash, drawn on Megabank. It was my life savings, plus the premium I'd made Edward Lee Shore pay me, compensation for my time and my stress, and the financial near-death experience he put me through. Thanks, I said. Then I handed the draft back to her and told her to reopen all of my accounts, just like it was before before I almost lost everything else. The advisor took the draft and turned to go, but Shore stopped her. What about my accounts? My wire? You saw the letter we both signed. You have the consent you need. The advisor smiled and said, yes, of course, but then I stopped her. You won't be sending any wires today, I told Shore. But you agreed, he said. It's in the letter. I saw it with my own eyes. You wrote it and signed it, and I signed it. We both consented. I'm not so sure that's what the letter says, I said. Shore reached out to snatch the letter from the advisor's desk, but she pulled it back out of reach. I didn't need to see the letter. I remembered it perfectly. It was full of lawyer flourishes and recitals, filled with wherefores and aforesaids and heretofores, with the occasional Latin phrase tossed in. When it came to what I wanted, it was perfectly clear, instructing Megabank to give me my money in a bank draft. All this I repeated, including the letter's final words, that once I had my money back, therefore the accounts of Lee Shore Investments may operate freely as before. That's what it said. So there's no freeze. I want my money. I want to send a wire. But I was in a rush when I drafted that letter, I said, and I'm not sure it has the desired legal effect. I think the bank needs to get a second opinion. The advisor thought so too, and so did the assistant branch manager when Shore started yelling. And when the branch manager herself arrived on the scene, she told Shore to leave and she'd get back to him once the bank's legal department had given an opinion. I'm not leaving until I get my money, Shore said, and then shouted. I turned and walked away, leaving him raving at the counter. Our money is back with Megabank, I said to my wife when I got home that evening. That was your all-nighter? I explained what had happened, how I'd messed up, and how I'd fixed it. She picked up her coat and said I was taking her out to dinner. The waiter set us down and I opened the menu. My wife snatched it out of my hand. You're done with investing, okay? Done with the principal protected notes and ROI and all that stuff. I nodded my head agreeably and explained that next time I'd research things way more carefully, that I'd never make a mistake like this again. My wife shook her head. I wasn't asking, she said. I was telling. 
I'm telling you that you're done with investing. The money stays in Megabank and an index fund. My wife meant it too. Ever since then, when I bring my monthly draw home, she dumps the surplus into that super boring index fund at Megabank, where it's safe from the Edward Lee shores of the world and the dummies like me who fall for people like him. I hired a babysitter so I can go golfing twice a month. My wife isn't happy about it. My wife, who's 39, and I, 41 male, have been married for 12 years and we have three kids, who are 10, 7, and 4. I got in on the ground floor of a startup about 20 years ago and the business has since grown exponentially. I'm now in an executive level position. My wife works in retail. About 18 months ago, my wife was offered a promotion that would include a relatively small bump in pay but would require her to start working weekends, something she was able to avoid previously. They also dangled a carrot in front of her in the form of this promotion leading to a bigger and better promotion. She was very excited about the opportunity when she told me about it, but I expressed some concern about her having to work weekends. She would have to work five to six weekend shifts every month, so pretty much three-fourths of the weekends every month. I told her that's asking a lot of her when the bump in pay isn't that much, especially when we don't particularly need the extra money. But she was so excited to advance her career that she disregarded my concerns and accepted the position. Since she started the new position, I've told her many times how I'm feeling stressed and burnt out by not really having breaks during the week. I work a stressful job five days a week, and then I have to go into solo parent mode almost every weekend. On the weeks my wife works weekends, she gets two days off during the week pretty much all to herself, especially during the school year. Yes, she uses this time to run errands and do things around the house, but she also uses it to meet up with friends and do things for herself. I don't have free time to do similar things for myself. My weekends are filled with activities for the kids. The one weekend a month my wife doesn't work is allocated as family time at the request of her. Whenever I brought this up to her, she would tell me that her position is temporary until she gets another promotion, but that hasn't happened yet. This summer, I started hiring a teenage babysitter in our neighborhood to watch our kids for a few hours twice a month on Saturday so that I can go golfing with my friends. It's done wonders for my stress level and the social interaction greatly improves my mood. The kids look forward to it as well because they like the babysitter. When I first told my wife about this, she was upset because not only am I spending money on a babysitter just for myself, I'm also spending money on golf, which pretty much cancels out the money she makes that day or even more. When I told her how much better I feel having time for myself, she tells me that I should do that in a way that isn't so expensive. The last time she brought this up, I reminded her that even after her promotion, I still make over two times what she does and that her bosses probably lied to her about another promotion because no one else would take the position that she did. She got mad at me for insulting her career and for spending hundreds of dollars every month just on myself. Not the jerk. You need a break. Mental health is important. If it doesn't hurt your family's financial situation, it's money well spent. Not the jerk. She forced solo parenting on you. You're simply making the best out of a bad situation that she unilaterally created. If it were me, I'd increase the number of hours and days to make it a real break, not just a few hours. But I'm a jerk. Not the jerk. And your wife was a fool for taking that promotion without a timeline and written contract stating when the other promotion was to happen and what it entails. What she got isn't so much a promotion as it's just a means of getting someone to work the weekends and the raise is probably little more than the differential many retail places pay for working undesirable shifts. It doesn't sound like the money you're spending on golf is a hardship. Denying you that outlet would just lead to other issues. Yeah, you could spend a couple evenings a month out with the guys, but that's not something you'd want to do after working all day and if you take a weekend evening for it, she'd complain that it's cutting into the time you have to spend together. I think your wife jumped at the word promotion without actually thinking it through. Either she gives up a day of her family time to cut the cost by one day of babysitting fees, or she accepts that the cost of a couple days of golf a month is worth it for the physical and mental health benefits to you. Am I the jerk for leaving itemized tips to compensate for my wife's behavior? My wife and I, in our 30s, dine out every once in a while, but not too often because of my wife's annoying habit inherited from her family. She always complains, sends food back if it's not absolutely perfect, and makes needless requests and substitutions. She doesn't have allergies or sensitivities. It can easily take five minutes for her just to order her own food, and sometimes I've already finished my meal by the time she gets her food because she sends it back, asks for modifications, etc. I know restaurant staff don't appreciate it. 
I've tried talking to her about this, but she doesn't see an issue with it. Anyway, we make decent money and we use our combined fun funds on dates and dinners. I recently started writing what my wife does on the receipt and then calculating a tip, in addition to the normal gratuity, to compensate. So, to a receipt, I might add, complained about not having this beverage, plus $5. Asked five questions about a single menu item, plus $5. Asked for new drink because too much ice, another $5. Sent meal back, was exactly what she had ordered, another $5. She didn't notice me doing it the first two or three times, but last night she noticed I was spending a lot of time on writing a tip amount and asked why. I showed her what I wrote. She's been mad at me since, saying I'm embarrassing her to the staff. I told her she's embarrassing both of us. Am I the jerk? Petty, maybe, but am I a jerk? Edit. My wife is otherwise a very nice, caring, and generous person. She does always say please and thank you, even for the most absurd requests. Annoying each other like this is our love language, but this time she's pretty mad. Oops. Update. Alright, we've had our laughs and shared our perspectives. Since my wife frequents this subreddit, I went ahead and showed her this post. With that said, I'd like to address a few things. First, she and I both know that any posts on this sub are peepholes into people's lives and characters, not display cases. Yes, my wife's behavior when dining out is bad, which is why I tried to think of a way to point it out and make up for it. That said, she's not a bad person. Learn to separate the two and you'll get far in life. Secondly, when I said she was mad at me, I don't mean that she's deeply hurt and distraught. She's calling me a jerk, yes, but that's normal for us. If this was something that was actually hurtful, I wouldn't be sharing it online. Anyway, she would like for all of you to know that she's taking your responses to heart and she's going to be more mindful of how she dines. She would like to add that she didn't think it was a big deal before because, as she puts it, she doesn't think twice about meeting expectations in her line of work, even if they are above and beyond the norm. She's just happy to meet demand, but she recognizes that not everyone else feels that way. She's going to try to be a better customer. She said reading this was brutally eye-opening, but we both also found some laughter and had a good discussion. Not the jerk. This is great. Maybe seeing it written down will give her some perspective. These types of patrons are the worst, and it's such a second-degree embarrassment when they're at your table. Not the jerk. I think it's hilarious. I bet the servers also enjoy the little fun and the extra money. Not the jerk. I'm a former server who worked at multiple restaurants. I would have hated to be serving your wife, no matter how polite she is. I have other tables and she sounds like a time drain who's impossible to please. Your embarrassment isn't an overreaction. The servers are definitely judging and gossiping about her. I appreciate your itemized receipts. They would have made me laugh and been shown to work buddies. Too much ice? Really? Get out. You're the jerk. Your money does not make up for your wife's behavior. Everyone deserves to be treated with respect and dignity. Your wife treats them horribly and you throw money at them. All you're really doing is enabling her to continue this behavior. If you really cared, you would stop going to sit down restaurants. Order takeout and eat at home or the park so she has nobody to harass. I snooped through my girlfriend's laptop and I saw her mean girl comments about me. My girlfriend, female 23, and I, male 25, have been dating for a little under a year now. We met three years ago when she was in college and I was spending the summer at a relative's in the same city as her. We met on a dating app, went on a date, and we started hooking up. I thought she was a sweet girl and very cute, but nothing else ever happened because a week after she started classes again, she told me she was seriously talking to someone. I left for grad school and so we didn't speak again. We had each other on Instagram though, until about a year ago when she ended up going to grad school at the same institution. I saw her on Instagram that she was there, slid into her DMs, and we started dating again. I thought she showed pretty much every green flag I could imagine. She has lots of friends she's really close to, close to her family, volunteers, has lots of hobbies, and she's academically and professionally successful. She's so incredibly sweet and considerate. For example, my birthday was just a month after we started dating, and yet she still got me a perfect gift. She's pretty much loved everywhere she goes. Her colleagues love her, my friends love her, my family loves her. I also want to emphasize how not mean-spirited she is. I've definitely dated girls before who were mean towards people around them, but my girlfriend is nothing at all like that. The only times I've heard her talk badly about people, it's like she's in a stand-up comedy special. It's all humor and nothing mean. And she never gets into arguments with her friends or family and is pretty much on good terms with everyone she's ever met. Anyways, today she was working on her computer and she left for the gym. For some reason, she left it on. I think she had some research thing running. It was on the kitchen counter, so I had to move it, 
and I saw a Google Drive folder shared with a bunch of people. I know I should absolutely not have looked, but my curiosity got the better of me. Basically, it was a folder shared with her friend group from college, which is about 10 girls and they're super close. There were a lot of subfolders. The first one I looked at had homework keys and back exams for their classes. Then I looked at a specific document. It was massive, like 100 pages, and there were subheadings for different topics. It seemed like a collection of out-of-pocket things any of them had said. Each one was cited with the name of the person who had said it. As I was scrolling through, I saw my name under a subheading, men, with a chicken emoji. It just said gross and mean stuff about me that I don't want to repeat. They were all signed with my girlfriend's name. I felt bad about snooping until then, but after that, I really wanted to see if there was anything else about me. I looked through the rest of the file, and there were insults about basically everyone she'd ever met, including about every man my girlfriend had ever been with. Honestly, mine were way less mean than theirs. I guess that's a positive. There was also a folder with presentations it seemed like my girlfriend had made and presented before each semester in college. They were all titled with something like Roster and The Date, and they had a slide for every man she was talking to, as well as a recap for whoever she had been with over break. Of course, I was there with my full name and pics of me and a picture of my car too. The only description of me was, 6 out of 10, bought me cigs. There were some very mean things about other guys they knew, like ranking them on a loser scale. The only other thing I saw about me was in a folder titled, Life Changing Moments, that had a list for each of them. There were a lot of insane things about my girlfriend in there that I had never heard of, think diseases and how she'd gotten them. There was also one about me which basically said, hooked up with him and realized I needed to get out of this era if I don't want to end up being a sad loser too. This is the one that really got me, as it seemed so much meaner than everything else, and I have no idea what she meant by it. It was getting close to the time she would be back though, so I just closed everything and locked her laptop. She got back, I didn't mention anything, and we just had dinner as normal. I'm here now because I have absolutely no idea what to do. Everything I saw was awful, and yet she's the last person I would ever expect something like this from. I'm in disbelief, and I really don't know where to go from here. I'm hoping there's some explanation that doesn't make her the world's worst person, and yet I really don't want to confront her either. We have a great thing going, and I don't see any way that confronting her isn't going to lead to drama. I don't want to talk to anyone I know about this, in case we stay together and she then has to face them, so I thought I would ask here and see if anyone had any reason to apply to this completely absurd situation. Update. The responses were very mixed, but they gave me a lot to think about. I did some reflection and I realized her tone didn't really seem to be much meaner than the jokes she usually makes about people. The ones about me in particular I realized were actually hilarious, like I kept cracking up about the LinkedIn one. And they were honestly entirely accurate too. What I was honestly really bothered about was that I was included and I pretty much wanted to know if she actually liked me or was just settling. I knew about her many boyfriends before, so I wasn't that upset about it either and I felt like it wasn't my place to say anything about them. I decided that I needed to confront her because the situation was upsetting me a lot. I decided that I was going to A. Ask her about the 6 out of 10 rating because it honestly hurt my pride a lot. B. Ask her about the sad loser comment because that was the one that seemed the meanest. And C. Ask her in general if she actually wants to be with me. It would have also been a deal breaker if she kept updating the document with stuff about me after we'd started dating or if she'd had any really unacceptable stuff on people. That said, I did realize that I wanted to mess with her a bit. I've never met anyone who takes it better than her. Like any time I've seen people making jokes about her, she takes it very well and enjoys it, so I didn't think it would upset her too much. The day after I made the post, we didn't see each other until dinner. I had been a bit weird all day over text, but she didn't think much of it and just asked me if I was okay. I devised my plan at this point, so over dinner, I dropped that I was considering buying a LinkedIn Plus subscription for networking. She gave me a side eye like I have never seen before and asked me why on earth I would do that. I saw her later texting her group chat. I didn't see what, but I was pretty sure it was about that. The next day, she seemed suspicious, so I decided to really finish it off. She went to work and I had the day off, so I decided to really go to town on my Instagram story. I actually just post a lot of aesthetic pictures that I do spend a lot of time taking. I think that comment in her doc was probably because on our first date, I took some pics for my Instagram story and she said something like, oh, I like those. And I said, eh, they're not really good enough. And she laughed at me even at the time. So anyways, that day I roamed around the city to all my favorite aesthetic spots and posted probably 10 or so stories, which I imagine annoyed everyone a lot. 
She slid up on them, and by the tenth one, she said, Dang, you're really going to town on these today. So I replied something like, Yeah, it gets me in the mood, you know? To which she replied with a confused emoji. At this point, I think she had caught on, and I had honestly been acting a bit off too, because my pride was still a little bruised, and I was also regretting having snooped. That night, she came to my place with my favorite dinner, and suddenly, for her, asked me if there was anything I wanted to talk about. At this point, I laid it out for her, and I prefaced it with apologizing for snooping, but that the title of the document had caught my eye. She looked absolutely mortified, but was also laughing and kept apologizing. I laid out my three concerns to her, and she told me that, A, the 6 out of 10 was truthful at the time, but she did like me a lot, as evidenced by dating me. B, the sad loser comment was about all the people she knew who only hooked up with others and never had real relationships, and that hooking up with me made her realize that she would much prefer to be in a relationship with someone like me, and that C, yes, obviously she loved and liked and respected me a lot. She also invited me to look through the folder freely, and that she wasn't ashamed of anything in there, just embarrassed that I had seen those comments about myself. I checked and there was nothing in there about me since we'd started dating. The only stuff was from when we'd hooked up. She also pointed out a document that I hadn't looked at before. It was in a folder titled Rankings and each girl had a document in there. She only let me look at hers, but it was basically a ranking of every person she'd ever been involved with in any way. It was a long document with comments. I was first and where for everyone else there was a list of pros and cons, mine just said, love him. Also, it seemed like they would all comment on each other's to argue about the ranking, but mine just had comments from all the girls, pretty much affirming the choice and praising me. So I was pretty satisfied with what I saw, and it also seems like they only update it now with stories gossip, or pictures, and no insults or anything else like that. My girlfriend was overall mortified and extremely apologetic, and I was also apologetic about looking through it, and told her she could look through anything I owned if she wanted to, but she turned me down. She wasn't upset about the snooping at all, and said that she had nothing to hide and that she would have done the same thing if she had seen a folder as artfully and intriguingly named as theirs. So yeah, we are all good. This is kind of weird. It's still giving major red flags, like who does all this, especially into adulthood beyond college. Everyone in this post is incredibly annoying. And really strange, people certainly chat with their friends about all aspects of life but keeping records and documentation of asinine incidents, events, and ratings of other people is really weird. I mean, I'm glad things worked out for OP and his girlfriend, but the situation is just weird. I know jokes are jokes, but the fact the girlfriend has a folder with rankings and seems to be alright with the way people make these types of comments that are pretty rude is really not good. Am I the jerk for asking my husband if he has money for ice cream? This past year has been really hard on my husband. He hates his job, is having a difficult time trying to see his son, and a lot of debt has stacked up from reckless spending trying to make him feel better. We recently started to combine finances as well as having separate ones. This was done so I could manage our money and pull us out of debt again. This has been working great until the other night. My husband and I were at my mom's for dinner, and as we started to pack up to leave, he asked if we could get Dairy Queen. I asked him if he had money for Dairy Queen. I will add the only reason I asked is because each time we get paid, we both take out spending money. On this pay cycle, he took $200 and I took $40. Well, he didn't have money for ice cream and I didn't want to spend the household money because it was going to dip into bills. My mom gave us $10 and we went on our way. In the car, he decided he didn't want ice cream and we ended up getting popsicles at the store later. I thought all was good until last night. He stated that I not only embarrassed him in front of my mom, but that I was being financially mistreating and he would no longer let me handle the money and I would have to give him an itemized list of bills if I wanted money to pay them. I apologized for embarrassing him and said my intention was not to mistreat him, but to help him think about his spending habits. I pointed out that he took $200 for spending money and I took $40. I still have $32 and he already went through $200. He said most of that went to paying people back for money he had borrowed so it doesn't count. We still haven't come to a new plan on how to handle money, and I'm thinking about staying at my mom's tonight so he has time to think. I hope he's just overwhelmed with life and not realizing he's upset in general. So, am I the jerk for asking my husband if he had money for ice cream? Update. First, I want to say thank you to everyone commenting on this. It's really helping me figure out how to deal with the situation better. A few things I would like to add. Both my husband and I work full time, but my husband hasn't made it to a full week of work in months. He typically misses half to three days every week 
so we're pretty even on the money we're bringing into the household right now. I would also like to add that I'm autistic and so is my mother, so I often miss social cues and I've realized and I did apologize to him and that if it was wrong of me to say that in front of my mom, I just didn't know that I had messed up. The last thing I would like to add, and I don't mean to sound petty by this, we've already spent $100 on ice cream for this month. He has an addictive personality and we've been working on that, so I know a couple of bucks doesn't seem like a lot, but when a quarter of a grocery budget, if not more, goes to ice cream, I was expecting him to use his own personal spending money that was given to him at payday when we divided it. Update 2. We both went to work this morning. We spent most of the day texting each other YouTube links about conflict resolution to prepare to talk. When we got home, we started with talking about things we enjoy with each other. Then we started talking about how we both handle issues. The solution we came up with is going back to completely separating finances. When it comes to bills, we share, we will decide who will be responsible to making sure that the bill is paid in a timely manner. We're also going to factor in how much we make versus domestic duties and make sure we are fair with it on both sides. If one covers more bills, the other will do more house duties. We haven't done the math on it yet, but have started a chore plan. I have family coming over for the next few days, so we're going to wait till they're gone and take a day to make a full plan and also talk about life and stuff to be on the same page again. Part of our talk will be potentially getting a financial consultant so a third party can help. Getting him a new job as soon as possible will be on the agenda. He applied for two today. I also want to pick up more hours at work so I can build up a backup fund. As I stated earlier, I work two jobs. One is a 9 to 5 type job and the other is a small business I manage on my own that's just hitting consistent profit. The 9 to 5 is what I'm going to start investing more time into for the short term so I have backup savings he can't touch. He did admit he was harsh with his comments. He was financially mistreated in the past and he panicked and tried to set a boundary in his mind but realized it was emotional. We will handle shared issues together and the rest is on our own. I gave him all the info on his student loan and medical bills and told him he will need to be responsible for making sure those get paid. This is going to be what we do for now. And I did bring up in the future, if we have kids, we will redo this. I told him that I will not be a stay-at-home mom and homeschool our kids like we planned without major changes being made to this. I will not go into a situation I have no safety net. He said he understood and we would deal with it when it came up. He also said that if I do become a stay-at-home mom one day, that he wants to do a post snub to make sure that I'll be okay and make the best choices for our kids' future in case things ever go south. He was a teen parent and bad choices were made on both sides. He has a great relationship with his son long distance, but the ability to go see him is wrapped up in relationship drama on the baby mama side. Her current partner will not let him speak with any of the dads of the three kids. So it's very important for him to make fair agreements if the worst happens so we can do what's right for our potential kids. Huge thanks to everyone that commented and for the advice. Not the jerk, but I'm echoing concerns about your husband's understanding of his financial habits. He's going to drag you down like an anchor in the sea if he can't get a grip, OP. Not the jerk, but fundamentally, if your husband doesn't see a problem with his spending habits, there's a bigger concern here. There's no point in trying to show him how to handle his money if he doesn't think there's an issue with the way he's handling his finances. You're a wife, not a mother. You can't micromanage your adult partner if they're insistent on being reckless. Um, why is he calling in so much? He sounds lazy. If he wants more money, he needs to actually go to work and stop calling in. OP. I used to work at the same place as him. It's super toxic and it's horrible. I've been begging him to quit for months. If he wanted to work more and gain more income, he would. If he wanted to quit, he would. If he wanted to manage his money better, he would. Why are you expected to be the only adult in this relationship? The customer who tipped a fake $100 bill. I work as a server. This one guy always comes to the restaurant I work at. He usually is pretty quiet and he never tips too well. Most of the time he comes with a couple of friends or by himself and sits at the bar and watches a sport game. I've never had a problem with him until he came in one time with a date. I've never seen the woman before, so I assume they were new to dating. Anyways, they sit at a table this time in a more quiet part of the restaurant and they were set at one of my tables. I had no problem with them and everything was going fine. They asked for the check and I went right around the corner from their table. It was close by so I was quick. As I was coming back to the table, the guy says to the woman, Watch this, as he puts down a $100 bill on the table. He saw me see and he was joking like, Oh, you weren't supposed to see that. I was ecstatic either way, even though it was so obvious he was trying to impress her. I didn't care. I waited till they left to go grab the $100 bill. 
Well, when I unfolded it, it was one of those fake $100 bills, I guess for pranks. That means this guy planned this out to impress the woman. It was so frustrating because I needed the money, but at the same time, I thought it was because I did a great job. Either the woman was in on it or he decided to be a jerk in two different ways. Told my manager and he was like, wow, that's ridiculous. I decided to hold on to it because I knew the day would come when I could get back at this guy. Two weeks later, my manager recognizes the guy and while I was working at the time, I was in a different side of the restaurant which was already full. My manager found me and asked if I wanted that customer's table and told me he was with the woman from last time. I often joked with my manager about throwing the fake $100 bill back on the table in front of that woman if he ever came back to embarrass him. I thought to myself, yeah, I may be busy already, but I also thought, sure, what's one more table? Told my manager, absolutely. No problem, with a smirk on my face. Before I went over to their table, I ran out to my car to grab the fake $100 bill that was sitting in my cup holder for this exact moment. I get to their table and they instantly recognize me. The woman seemed normal, but the guy looked like he was nervous. I pretended nothing happened all the way until I got their check. When I brought the check back, I placed it down on the table as well as the fake $100 bill, but left it unfolded so the fake part was showing. I looked at the guy and said, Hey, not sure if you remember me from last time, but I believe you forgot this, just returning it because I believed it was too much. The woman looked very confused, so I instantly knew she was not part of it, but the guy got very nervous and said, I don't know what that is. I said, oh, my mistake, and laughed and said to the woman, have a good night, and I walked away. When I came back, there was a big zero dollars on the signed copy and a $50 bill, real this time, where the woman was sitting after they had left. One can only assume that the guy didn't want to tip on his card, so he wrote obnoxiously big zeros on the tip, and that $50 just so happened to be where the woman was sitting, so I'm hoping she had placed it there. Now I don't know what happened with the couple or if they stayed together, but I haven't seen them back since and it's been a few weeks, and I really hope she looks for his red flags now. Here's your pizza with everything. When I was in college, a long time ago, I worked at a national pizza chain. Mostly I delivered, but I got some extra benefits for running one or two shifts a week as a manager. The following happened when a customer came in complaining about not having enough toppings on the company's version of a deluxe pizza. So for a bit of context, when a customer asks for a pizza with everything, most pizza places will default to their version of the deluxe. These pizzas usually have five to eight toppings, ours had seven, but they are not full portion toppings and are typically the equivalent of a three or four topping pizza. This is actually because they taste better that way and customers are not charged for a seven topping pizza or anything. So I'm managing a shift when I hear a customer absolutely going off on one of our clerks up front. I intercede and he proceeds to yell at me because he ordered a pizza a couple of weeks ago and barely got anything on it. I explained the portions and why we do them, etc., but he just got more irate. So I said, sure, I'll make you a pizza with full toppings of everything on it, but it's going to cost a fortune, taste terrible, and probably still be cold. So we entered into the system and the total comes to be like $60 or more, a lot at that time. He's obviously a little shocked, but he goes ahead and pays it. The pizza was like three inches tall. We couldn't even cut it with the wheel cutter and had to find a rocker cutter for it. It's ice cold in the middle because the ovens were not designed to penetrate that much stuff and there's no way to cook the center without burning the top and the bottom. All the cheese that was on top just slides into the cut as we're cutting it. It's just a train wreck of a pizza. You could barely even get it in the box. So I take it up front and hand it to the guy who obviously spent the entire time thinking how he could get his $60 back. So he opens it and starts feeling it and says, This meat is uncooked. I want my money back. I explained that all of our meats were pre-cooked and safe to eat from frozen, so he couldn't have a refund for something I warned him about. He argued for about five more minutes and threatened all sorts of things, but I just didn't care. In the end, he headed out with his pizza that most likely went straight into the trash. Am I the jerk for telling my father I'll cut ties with him if he doesn't come to my wedding? I'm 26 female. My father, who's 59, is a slightly known musician in my home country. Due to his career, he missed out on most of my milestones while I was growing up. School plays, a few birthdays, and both my high school and college graduations to name a few. Mostly events he was informed of months in advance and cancelled on me either weeks or days before. He always apologized for doing so but never really seemed to feel guilty. I remember we almost had a fight because I didn't want to watch a video he had missed my high school graduation to film. It hurt me so much as a kid that I stopped expecting him to show up. 
It still bothered me when I got older, but at that point I understood that it was his job and I should be grateful he even had one. I'm getting married in early September. My fiancé, 28, male, and I have been planning this wedding for a year and a half. The date was decided and invitations were sent months ago. Almost every guest has already RSVP'd. I've reminded my father of the date several times this past year and he kept assuring me he had blocked the entire week off of the wedding and would be there. A couple days ago, my father called to inform me he'd had to schedule a concert for my wedding day. He apologized and said he'd make it up to me with a gift. I don't want a gift. I want my father to come to my wedding. So I told him that either he figured out a way to reschedule, which I knew he could probably do if he tried, or I'd cut ties with him. What followed was one of the biggest fights we've ever had. He called me ungrateful, spoiled, and selfish for giving him that kind of ultimatum and expecting him to change his work schedule for my own benefit, which he has asked me to do on many occasions. He yelled, and I held myself not to yell back. We're still fighting over this. Most of my family is on my side, though both my mom, divorced from my dad, and my fiancé have warned me not to make any moves I might regret. My sister, who's 20, is on my father's side, which doesn't surprise me. I love my father, and I really don't want to stop talking to him, but I'm done with him expecting to be able to miss out on my life with no consequences. That being said, I'd be lying if I said that I don't feel guilty. Just writing this all down made me feel like a huge brat. Am I the jerk? Edit. I thought I'd clarify some things. My mom and my fiancé are 100% on my side. They told me to be careful because they know I don't really want to go no contact. Also, my mom has barely spoken to my father in almost 20 years, and my fiancé is with me because we love each other, not because of who my father is. My father is not a struggling artist. He's been in this line of work since before I was born. I wouldn't consider him rich, but he lives more than just comfortably. If I thought he couldn't afford to reschedule a concert, I wouldn't blame him for not being able to come to the wedding. And yes, he paid child support and provided for both me and my sister. I do have other people who can walk me down the aisle. My stepdad, which would make my dad furious, so I might do it purely out of pettiness. And at least two of my best friends would be more than willing to do so. My father isn't paying for any part of the wedding. He offered to, but I declined. I don't live with him anymore, and both me and my fiancé have good jobs. When I was younger, I told myself that once I didn't need his money anymore, I'd never ask for it again. My sister isn't the golden child. He missed many of her milestones as well. Update Someone said that my father doesn't see me as a person, but as an extension of himself. That one hurt the most, because it's the best definition of my relationship with my father I've ever seen. My father wasn't neglectful in the traditional sense. My parents divorced when I was seven, and my mom had primary custody of me and my sister, but we still went to his place several times a week. My mother is a teacher and couldn't raise us on her salary alone, so he was our main financial supporter even after the divorce. Because of all of this, he seems to believe he was the best father ever. Whenever we fought, he always insisted I was wrong and ungrateful. Those same arguments were used whenever I demonstrated I was upset over him missing out on my milestones. In his head, for instance, I couldn't get angry if he missed my high school graduation or if he didn't pay attention to any of the projects I developed in college, because he was the one paying for my education. I decided to stop complaining about this when I was younger, having realized I wouldn't be able to get him to see my side. This wedding incident felt like a turning point though, especially since he wasn't paying for anything this time. It made me accept that he doesn't care how much he contributed anymore, but still believes I don't have the right to be upset. I now realize there's no winning this. If he doesn't come, I'll be devastated. If he does, I'll always remember I had to force my own father to come to my wedding. At this point, I'm not even sure which is worse. A few days ago, I had a discussion with him over the phone, and I expressed all of the above and more. And as expected, he called me dramatic, accused me of alienating myself, and went off on me for talking to him the way I did. I just hung up on him. This is how our fights have gone since I was a teenager and it never solves anything. We haven't spoken since. I sent him a long text, basically saying I didn't want to hear from him until he was ready to both give me a sincere apology and own up to the status of our relationship being his fault. This is all wishful thinking. I really don't think either are going to happen. I love my father and I know he loves me to bits, but I can't do this anymore. He's been around my entire life and still barely knows me for who I am. It's his turn to make the effort. Right now, I'm trying to muster up excitement for my wedding. I lost most of it these past weeks. My fiancé, my mom, and my friends are all trying to cheer me up, and it's starting to work. I'm definitely feeling a lot better than I was last week. I'm really grateful to have them in my life. So that's it for now. Thank you all for your support on my previous post. OP's father easily accepted other commitments before his daughter's milestones, but he couldn't do the same with her in her life. 
Throwing money around and using that as an excuse for caring is nothing less than being lazy and a cheap loved one. Relationships are a two-way street. Wow, I can't believe OP has had to basically beg her own father to go to her wedding. This should be the time in her life and he does not seem to care. This man is all about himself. When she mentions to him how he has let her down, again, he calls her entitled. What a horrid man. Do you love your father and you know he loves you too? No, he doesn't. No father who loves his daughter would purposefully miss his daughter's wedding for work. She seems to interpret what he says as love while not interpreting his crappy actions as a lack of love. Paying for your kid's education isn't some special gift. It's expected. He expects to get special credit to act like a neglectful jerk because of his bare minimum contribution. Plus, it sounds like it wasn't exactly a burden to him financially anyway. He outsourced his parenting to OP's mother with money. He's repeatedly shown OP who he is, but she can't quite bring herself to believe that's who he really is. OP should just accept he doesn't care that much, peace out of the relationship, and stop making the effort with him. I think she'll find that she will have to wait months, if not years, before he even notices she's withdrawn from his life. My wife told me that someone else is her soulmate. My wife, M, met her best friend, Chuck, back in high school. They became close friends and Chuck came out to M. M was supportive. A year or so later, Chuck told his parents, and long story short, they kicked him out, and Chuck ended up living with M and her parents for the rest of high school. M and I started dating after college, and she told me all about Chuck and how close they were, and how he was like a brother to her. I met Chuck, and we got along and became friends. He's a great guy. At the time, Chuck was dating a guy. They ended up moving in together about the same time that M and I got engaged. M and I have been married for five years now. I'm a project manager and I took on a year-long project in another city. I have to leave at 5.30 a.m. every morning and get home around 6.30 p.m. M and I had a long talk about my job before I took on this project. We knew it would be a sacrifice for me to be working so much, but I'm getting more money than I ever thought I would. After this project, we can pay off our student debt and start trying to have a baby. We both agreed the money was worth it since it's only one year. That year will be up in late November. In March, Chuck caught his boyfriend cheating. He was devastated. M immediately told him that he could move in with us. I was fine with them moving in, but was not happy that M didn't even discuss it with me first. Chuck was pretty broken up and M was giving him lots of love and attention. I was fine with it because I know how much she loves him and he did need her. I also did my best to support him and make him feel loved as well. For a while, this was fine, but as time went on, M has continued to pour all of her attention into Chuck. Sometimes I get home from work and neither of them are there, and I found out that they went to a movie or out to dinner together. I don't think that there's anything romantic going on between them, but it has been annoying that I get left out of all the plans. The past few weeks, several things have happened. The three of us went to a party and someone joked about Chuck being our third wheel, and M said, Chuck is not the third wheel. I said, what? And she said, I've known Chuck longer than I've known you. A week or so after that, M and Chuck went out dancing one night. I had to work the next day, so I stayed home. I woke up at about 3 a.m. and M was not in bed. I went and found her and Chuck cuddled up on the couch asleep with the TV on. Both of those things made me uncomfortable. I also realized I had been working so much, I was just sort of letting M and Chuck plan everything and I had not planned a date night in a while. I decided I needed to be more active and so I planned a date night for last Friday. When I first told M, she was excited as we have not been on a date, just the two of us in a while. Friday, I got home at 6.30 and M and Chuck were not there. I took a shower and got ready. About 7.15, I called M as we had reservations for 8. She answered, and when I asked where she was, she said her and Chuck had gone shopping and were getting some dinner. I was kind of stunned and asked her about our date. She laughed and said, Oh, I forgot. Oh well. And that was that. She didn't even invite me to join them. I've tried to never be controlling of M or tell her what to do. I also tend to shut down when I get angry. When M forgot our date, I was mad, so I didn't say anything right then and there. But I knew I needed to address how I was feeling. So later that evening, I told her we needed to talk. I had written down some things so I could stay focused. I started by saying that I do love Chuck and he was always welcome in our home, but that I felt like our marriage was suffering and we needed to work on us. M blew up. She thought I was attacking Chuck. I guess I didn't word things well, and she started defending him and coming at me. We have never had a big fight before, 
We always talk and work things out. I was stunned that she was attacking me over this. She said some really awful things. Then she said, Chuck is my soulmate and you just have to get used to that. I just shut down. I didn't even know how to process that. I love M more than anything in the world, but in that moment, I realized that she loves Chuck more than she loves me. I thought M and I were soulmates, but to hear her say that she considers someone else her soulmate has been devastating. I don't remember the rest of the talk. She huffed off after a while and slept on the couch. Her and Chuck left together on Saturday and were gone for most of the day. When they got back, she's acting like nothing ever happened. On Sunday, she even made a small joke and batted her eyes to me, something she does when she's flirting with me. Normally I love it, but this time it just made me sick. I told her this was a busy week at work and I was just going to stay at a hotel near the job site, something that I've done a few times before, so I haven't seen her since Sunday night. I don't know what to do. Typing all of this up has made me realize I'm really burnt out with all of this travel. Maybe I checked out too much and haven't given her enough attention. But how do I move forward knowing she will never love me as I love her? Minor updates. Seeing a bunch of comments from women who say that they have more than one soulmate has given me... given me hope. To me, you only have one soulmate, but that's not a word M or I have ever really used, and I just really hope that she means it different than how I took it. We've been texting back and forth some this week, and we spoke on the phone last night. It wasn't anything big, she just called and said that she misses me and couldn't wait until I got home. I'll be home tonight. I told her we should talk about our fight last Friday, and she agreed and said she hates that we fought and we need to work it out. She said she loves me. We'll be talking tonight, and I guess I'll find out where I stand. Update. When I took the time to think about all of this and type it out, I realized how burnt out I was. Friday morning, I met with my team, and I scheduled some time off coming up soon. I'm in a much better headspace now, knowing that I have that downtime. Em and I had our fight on Friday night. Then I left Monday and stayed out of town all week for my project. Em texted me this Friday and said Chuck was gone for the weekend, so we could spend time, just the two of us, and that she wanted to make up for our missed date. I got home Friday evening, and we agreed to talk before doing anything else. I had written out everything I wanted to say, and she sat there and listened. We talked for a long time, and we each went back to some things to get clarification, so I'm not going to try and replay everything we said, just the main parts and the way that makes the most sense. I told her how I didn't like her joke about me being the third wheel, and how much it hurt that she forgot our date, and then how crushed I was that she said Chuck was her soulmate. There were some other little things too. When I was done, she said she was sorry, and she was wrong for saying those things. She said I'm not the third wheel, and I am her soulmate and she asked if she could explain why she had said what she did. When Chuck's parents first kicked him out in high school, he was really in a bad place. He told M's mom and they got him help. So when Chuck called in March about his boyfriend cheating on him, M had freaked out and was afraid that it could be a repeat of what happened last time. She said she felt like she needed him close so she could watch him and keep him safe. I had made a comment about how for the past six months, it seems like her and Chuck were living their best life together, and she said that she's been miserable this whole time, that she's been on the verge of a nervous breakdown. After our fight, she knew she was wrong and realized she needed to get help and let it go. She talked with Chuck and he promised that he was a stronger person than he was in high school. They agreed it was best if he moved out, both to give M and I time to work on us and so M wouldn't be obsessing over when he was coming and going. M wanted to talk to me last Sunday, but I had said I needed time and she wanted to give me space. It was a long talk with lots of tears. She apologized a bunch of times. She said she was so concerned with Chuck's mental health that she attacked me because she thought I was going to make him move out and she was lashing out. She acknowledged that she hurt me and said she loves me and she wants to work on herself and find ways to deal with her fear and worry in a healthy way. We've never really had a big fight before and we both agreed we could have handled it better. Her by not lashing out and me by not shutting down. We agreed to start couples counseling to help us learn how to disagree in a more healthy way. We were both emotionally drained after the talk, so we just ordered some food and stayed in. We cuddled in bed to watch TV, talk, and just be together. We've missed each other a lot these past few months, and it was really nice to just hold her. The next day, Saturday, we went on a date. We went to breakfast, went shopping, saw a movie, and even got pedicures together. Several times throughout the day, she would just stop and look at me and say she had missed me and she was so sorry she had pushed me away. Today, Sunday, we called Chuck, who was staying with another friend. He said he was sorry he had caused so much stress for M and me. He acknowledged he had been focused on himself and not even realized that we weren't doing well. 
He said he loved us both and is so grateful that we let him stay while he was getting over his breakup. He's looking at a few places and plans to be out in the next week or two. He did offer to move out right away, but I'm okay with him staying a little longer. I think having a plan in place is the most important thing. Our relationship took a hit, but we love each other and we're going to work on it. We set some boundaries and also agreed to always make each other our top priority. I have a few months left on this project, but we're going to make it a point to go on a proper date at least once a week and reserve some cuddle time on the weekends. Thank you to everyone who replied or sent me a message. I got some really good advice. I'm hopeful this experience will make us better and make our relationship stronger. I'm okay with this outcome. I totally see OP's side. I totally see where his wife overreacted and explained, but did not excuse her actions. But what I don't see is how Chuck just lived with two completely miserable people and thought it was all sunshine and rainbows. It kind of sucks that it was OP who had to clarify his lack of comfort, and only then did Chuck realize he was taking advantage of his friends. All those women that commented to OP that they have more than one soulmate, I guarantee they would be furious if their husbands ever said that to them. I can't imagine being the Chuck in this situation. Never felt weird staying for so long and taking so much of the wife's time away from her husband? The atmosphere in the house doesn't feel right? Never made the effort to connect with OP in some way? So insensitive, self-absorbed, and selfish. I don't care how good a friend you were or how hurt or in a deep, dark place you are. You are a guest and a friend. Behave like one. Be nice to your hosts, including M and OP both. I think OP wants everything fixed, so he's willing to sweep everything under the rug based on a minimal apology. Glad they're going to counseling though, as that may actually help them long term. Yeah, no. If my partner ever told me another woman was his soulmate, I'm sorry, but there's no apology or context that would ever make that okay. That is a relationship ending sentence. I've got to say, I do not like that update. It's very gaslighty. She blatantly doubled down on Chuck being her soulmate, but then completely changes her tune? And the third wheel comment? I'm sorry, but everyone knows a third wheel is the person not in the relationship. And her actions don't seem to fit someone who's worried about their friend. It presents as someone having an emotional affair. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I'm really wondering if wife may have talked with Chuck about whether or not they could be together. Then after Chuck telling her that would never happen, maybe that's when she changed her tone and started apologizing to her husband. But that's just a theory. A Karen theory. Am I the jerk for refusing to babysit the golden child's baby after he disowned me for being adopted? Plus updates. I, 20, female, was adopted when I was 16 by my half-brother and his wife, who were in their late 30s at the time. They already had six kids when they adopted me, but it was never an issue. They've treated me like their own kids since they met me and later adopted me. So did all the other kids. Except for one, their golden child who's only four months older than me. We'll call him Chad. Chad has always been an insensitive jerk to literally everyone, including our other siblings. He would always fight with us, say mean things to everyone and get away with it. He also had extreme anger issues that would result in broken doors, holes in the walls, etc. He also got to do everything me and my sister were never able to do. He got a free car, goes out at night, etc. When we were still in school together during high school, he got up in front of our whole class and told everyone that I wasn't his sister and I never would be. He then told me in front of his friends that I would never be a part of his family and I should just get over it and walked off. This was not a one and done thing. He would keep doing this up until he moved out and I stopped seeing him and talking to him. Golden Boy once again got the limelight of the family after he got married right after high school, moved out to his wife's family's house and then had a baby, the first grandbaby. Since this has happened, I've stayed as far away from him as possible only seeing him for family pictures every year because our mother asks. Recently, I decided to come forward to our mom about what he had said and did because she was upset about how I was distancing myself from him. She basically pulled the, that's still my kid and it's my first grandbaby card as the reason she wasn't going to be upset over it. I didn't really care to be honest. I knew it wasn't going to change her mind on her kid anyway. Out of nowhere, I got a message begging me to come to babysit for them because... You're the only one who can deal with these kinds of babies because no one else will. Apparently, they're weaning their kid off of natural feeding and the baby is extremely clingy because of that. And the fact that the mom is a germaphobe, so they've only been held by like six people since birth. They know I don't sleep for the most part because I'm an insomniac with ADHD and I also am not bothered by the crying. 
For some reason, I can sit for hours with a baby crying and it doesn't bother me. Can't tell if that's a blessing or a curse at this point. My sister's mad at me because apparently they haven't asked anyone else in the family for help but me and everyone wants to go see this baby. Am I the jerk for not wanting to be around or take care of the baby because its father said that I'm not part of his family? Update. After I posted this, I ended up talking to two of my friends from high school. They were actually there during multiple occasions where Chad publicly said all of that stuff. I talked with them for a little while. One of these friends actually came over almost weekly when I was still living at my parents' house, so she firsthand understands my family. We talked, and we all mutually agreed, I go this once, see if we can't mend things. If not, I can tell my mom and sister that I tried, but we're done with the whole thing, and if the whole negative thing with my family keeps up, I'll just cut them off for good. So I accepted to go babysit. I went over to Chad's house around 8 p.m. As soon as I showed up, I was greeted by Chad's wife, who was extremely happy to see me. She was tired. You could just tell that she had the I have a one-year-old face thing going on. She talked to me for a few minutes about how happy she was I came over and how she was glad to be going out with Chad. I kind of just listened to her go on and on before she finally got to the baby. Let's call him Seth. She explained to me his night route, feedings, etc. Nothing too big. Then she got to the end where she starts going on about how he was having crying fits at night and how he wouldn't get to sleep until mid-morning. I was a little eh on that, but all babies have difficult routes I guess. She then said they would only be gone for about 4 hours and that they would come home around 12.30, one at the latest. After this, Chad shows up from their room, literally starts talking to his wife, looks at me, and then just kind of looks me over for a minute and gives me a small wave and nod before heading out of the house. His wife follows and simply tells me to call or text if I need anything. For a minute, I was just stunned, but went to work to see Seth, which was odd because it was my first time seeing him in person and not in the photos that are hung around our partner's house. In person, he's the cutest little baby ever. He was fine the whole time, and he only cried because there was no one in the room, not because of the weaning. By this time, it was around 11.30, almost 12. I would check the clock every few minutes just to see what time it was. 12.30 rolled around and I'm like, should I text them? And I'm like, no, let me give them another few minutes until I need to text them. I ended up texting both of them at 1 asking where they were because they did say they would be home by now. I got no reply from either of them. They finally show up at 3 in the morning. I'm livid at this point, not even over having to take care of Seth for a longer period of time, but just because they never texted me back. Like, what if there was an emergency or something? They walk into the living room and I'm just like, I texted asking where y'all were at and no one answered. And Chad's wife starts saying that, Oh, Chad said it was fine and that it would only be an hour more. And I was just like, You know what? It's fine. Whatever. Seth is sleeping. She looks at me all weird and I just rolled my eyes and said, It's not the weaning that's making him cry at night. He gets lonely. He's clingy. Just let him know that you're in the room when he starts crying and he'll go right back to sleep. I started to walk out with my stuff. As I was right about to walk completely past Chad, when I turned around and was like, so you aren't going to say anything to me? After I looked after your kid for like seven hours now? He snorted at me and was like, no, my wife is the one who talked me into this anyway. Ticked off at this point, I said, so this wasn't, I don't know, possibly a way to be able to apologize for high school or maybe all those other times you decided to outcast me from the family? Because I was under the impression that maybe you wanted to patch things up because of you asking me of all people to watch your kid. He sat there for a minute and just said, Why should I apologize? Because literally nothing from high school has changed. Man, you really do need to grow up and understand that me and my wife aren't going to cater to you like mom and dad did because you're adopted. You ain't our family and you won't ever be. At this point, I just got in my car and left. I ended up texting my mom about all of it, thinking she would get it in the morning when she woke up. No, of course she had to be awake. She apparently told Chad's wife about the conversation we had about all the stuff Chad had said and done to me in school. Apparently, his wife felt bad because she had an adopted sister too and felt horrible that Chad had done and said all those things. Apparently, mom didn't know about Chad asking about the babysitting thing until now and she started talking to the wife who is now upset. Apparently, she thought Chad would have changed since then and didn't think he would act this way that he did when I left. I told my mom that I'm done with him and that if something ever happens with Seth, then I would be there, but I was done with them until that happens. The way things are going, I will most likely be cutting my whole family off, because this isn't worth the stress anymore. Update. 
The first day or two after the interaction with Chad was a bit hectic. Both of them were blowing up my phone, trying to get me to talk to them. Mostly my mom just making excuses for Chad and my sister trying to basically just tell me to get over it. I ended up telling the both of them, in text and over the phone, that I was over it and I would be cutting myself off completely from Chad and his little family. This sparked some anger, but my mother soon went quiet and later my sister. Everything seemed to be going pretty good after that for a while. That was until a week later when my sister showed up unannounced at my apartment demanding that I take the blessing of getting to be around Chad's sheltered kid when no one else seemed to be able to, basically acting like it was some huge honor that I was asked to babysit. I almost snapped. I wanted to call her a jerk and tell her to get off my property and then not come back because I was just so sick of it, but I didn't. From my doorstep, I told her that if she wants to see the baby so bad, just go over and see it. It wasn't my issue to deal with and I slammed the door in her face and watched her leave. It's been radio silent now for a while until earlier this week. I was scrolling on Instagram when I noticed that my oldest brother, the one that I get along super well with and who has supported me about curing Chad off, his girlfriend and him have posted pictures of their proposal. I noticed the post had been made last week, but no one had told me, not even my mother. I texted my brother's girlfriend asking her about literally everything that was happening. She was surprised because my mother had said she had told everyone in the family about the wedding. She then told me that they would be holding a family meeting at my parents' house to talk about the wedding plans. I said okay. The meeting was for today around dinner time. I showed up and walked into the house and noticed that a lot of stuff was different decoration-wise. My parents had our family photos all arranged around the living room and a few random frames with multiple small photos in them as well. I noticed that they had replaced multiple small photos of specifically me from the frames and replaced them with now pictures of Chad and his wife and my older brother and his girlfriend. What were maybe six pictures of me on any of the walls? There were now two, a baby picture of me and my senior high school photo that are now in the hallway, not even the living room. I ignored it and didn't say anything. After a while, everyone showed up, except for, of course, Chad, who my mom pulled the, he wanted to spend time with the baby, BS. They all started talking about the people plans of the part, aka people who were going to be key parts of the wedding cast. I tried my best to listen and take in all of what my brother's girlfriend was saying. I noticed by the end of it all, my name was literally never added into any of the main plans. I wasn't mentioned at all in the plans. I started to question why I was there if I wasn't going to be in the main plans of the wedding. I was kind of like, why not just send me an invitation then? I went home and texted his girlfriend asking about what had happened at the little meeting. Apparently, my mother had told her that I wouldn't want to be involved in any of the wedding stuff and that it wasn't my thing. She called me unfeminine and that I wouldn't like doing any kind of bridal stuff because I'm not girly. She then said everything was set in stone now. My older sister is going to be a bridesmaid and my little sister is going to be a flower girl. My little brother will be the ring holder and my other little brother and Chad will be the groomsmen. And apparently, my mother also told her that because of what happened with Chad that I shouldn't be set at the family table but at a guest table. I will just be another guest at the wedding. I really didn't say anything back because it hurt. It hurt that my mother would say that about me. That I wasn't feminine just because I don't enjoy a lot of girly things in my spare time. That I wasn't going to be able to enjoy doing something like a wedding or be a bridesmaid. I can't believe she would say that about me. To be honest, I don't even know if I'm going to go. The wedding is scheduled for the end of the year. It sounds stupid and petty, but this hurt me. It hurt that I'm being outcasted, most likely due to Chad once again. As I'm typing this, my sister is texting me about how she's helping plan all the bride stuff. Update. Chad's wife is pregnant again. Am I the jerk for refusing to help my privileged wife cover her increased cost of living? So I, male 39, am married to the love of my life, who's 36. We only have two kids, ages 5 and 9, and we all live in a house in a nice small typical Scandinavian town. Our economy is mostly shared, more on this in a bit. I'm an engineer working as a consultant. Great pay and benefits. I make more than I spend. My wife has a master's degree in human communication, a horribly useless degree, even according to herself. Since graduating something like eight years ago, she's been unable to find a job in her field. Note, those eight years do include her second pregnancy and maternity leave. Here's the thing. My wife has very wealthy parents, like no financial worries at all wealthy. Thanks to them, her share of our house was gifted to her. I still pay mortgage on my share. They gifted her a brand new car. I drive my own. Each Christmas, they gift her $20,000. Her, not me. 
Besides that yearly gift, she has more or less been without income for most of her adult life, including when she attended university. She did hold a few odd jobs here and there. We share all family-related expenses, utilities, food, insurance, vacations, kids stuff and so on, through a shared account, 50-50. Besides that, we have our own accounts, but many purchases go towards the family, house, kids anyway, so it's not like airtight. You know how it is. My wife recently got a part-time job, 15 to 20 hours per week in a clothing store. The pay is terrible, hours are weird, and she doesn't get along with the owner. Therefore, she's considering quitting. I'm telling her to go ahead, but also that even a bad job pays better than no job. In my opinion, she's a little picky with jobs, won't do cleaning, elderly care, and other stuff like that, despite those jobs being the ones that she's able to get without any qualifications. She keeps applying for jobs in her own field, but so far without any luck besides a couple of first round interviews. The market is very limited. Because of increased cost of living, you all know the story, her yearly gift and small paycheck don't quite cut it anymore. She tells me that she's barely making ends meet. Therefore, she's asked me to help her out by paying a larger share of our shared expenses. I basically said no. I told her that not many people are as privileged as her and that she really should be less picky or even consider requalification new education or a new field of work. I felt bad telling her this, but also needed to be honest with her. I could help her out, but that just doesn't sit right with me, all things considered. So now, of course, according to her, I'm the jerk. But am I? Edit. My wife did full childcare for both kids, one year of maternity leave per kid. As of now, daughter who's nine goes to school and son who's five is in kindergarten. No childcare is needed. Chores around the house are shared more or less equally. And when describing her degree as terribly useless, I meant in terms of job possibilities, nothing else, and she agrees. Everyone sucks here. I'll probably get downvoted, but this is why having separate finances in marriage is a really bad idea. You guys are married and you have kids. You're meant to be a team. It's absurd that you've been paying a mortgage payment on your half of the house and that she keeps $20,000 annually from her parents. It's also absurd that you have a great job, she's working a very low-wage job, and you expect to keep splitting things 50-50 like your roommates. Helping her out doesn't sit right with you because you've been treating each other badly for so long. This whole arrangement needs an overhaul and apologies from both of you. Not the jerk, but you said your wife's parents are wealthy. They will not live forever. If your wife inherits their money when they pass, are you going to be willing to accept if your wife tells you that you still have to pay your half of everything on your own? Will you be okay if she takes a vacation and you can't afford to go because your half costs more than you can afford? Everyone sucks here. This is a weird situation. You're married and you're supposed to be a team. Partners. You two need to sit down and make some serious changes to the way you've been living your lives. Do you even still love her and want to be married to her? I've seen a story before that was almost identical to this, but the genders were flipped. Everyone laid into the husband, called him a useless man-child, and told her she should divorce him. Hmm, I wonder why that's not what you are all saying this time around. Oh, I know, because here on Reddit, you always excuse crappy behavior as long as it's a certain type of person who is the one doing it. I ruined a romance scammer's life. Context, I'm a woman in my 30s with a reasonably good corporate type job in a field with lots of room for growth and I'm recently back into the dating scene after a decade. I'm kind of a would be a 10 if she lost 30 pounds looking girl. Beautiful face, a few extra pounds, but I never have issues getting a date. I'm not well off, but I'm stable and I have a bit of spending money. What happened? A few weeks ago, I met a very charming man from a Latin American country only a couple of years younger than me. Seemed very sweet, cuddly, intelligent, family-oriented, emotionally available, educated, and in a good profession back home in his country, and he had a lot in common with me. Chemistry seemed amazing. He was honest that he was in my country on a tourist visa, but was hoping to stay. I made it clear I wouldn't be able to help him with that, but we'd have a fun summer fling while he was here. If he managed to stay or come back, only then could we consider a real relationship. Then the other shoe dropped. A couple weeks and four dates in, during a text conversation about my work, he asked me to be his sugar mommy. I initially laughed and assumed it was a joke. He kept pushing and clearly said it wasn't. Of course, feeling insulted by this, I went off on him. He maintained it as a serious ask until I hit a nerve with my complaints about how embarrassed he should be to ask me this. Then he got angry and insulted me for thinking he was serious about it. No apology for being hurtful. 
Obviously, what I did next was take screenshots and cry about it to my closest friends. I was hurt that I was fooled into thinking he liked me and that he thought I needed to pay for a man. My friends started a fuse on what happened next. One of my friends started snooping more on his online presence. Together, we found out six different Instagram accounts that were him using different variations of his name and different photos of himself, all uploaded in batches. On Facebook, a similar pattern. All very scammy and suspicious looking. He had been foolish enough on one of his profiles, though, to follow and tag the employer that he was working for illegally on his tourist visa in my country. So I contacted another close friend in a local law enforcement agency that works with immigration. She looked up his file. He had a wife and a daughter at home. I released the hounds after that. The friend who helped me investigate online made several group chats on multiple platforms with all of his family, immediate and extended, and friends. She released all of the screenshots as well as a rant about how shameful it was. As they started blocking her, she added more people. I found his sister's phone number, sent her text messages there too. Everyone he knows, including his wife, knows he's unfaithful and trying to take advantage of others. 30 minutes after the online bombardment started, I got a rude message from him about how I should be smart enough to know he was joking and he doesn't need to sell himself. I didn't reply. Next step? Online immigration reporting form with all the info we found. Work info, employer name, and address. His home address. Full name, date of birth, photos, screenshots admitting to working. Usually these reports take months to be reviewed, if at all. But I gave the file number to my law enforcement friend. Two days later, law enforcement officers visited him at home. They found him with a phone number that was issued to a local resident. All his roommates also had numbers issued to the same person, a direct link to the employer. He received a caution for trying to scam me, a no-contact order, and a flag on his immigration file that, based on his country of origin, will likely mean he can never return, as well as a strict warning to not work without authorization. His roommates also received warnings. His employer received a visit next. They found significant proof that they had been employing him illegally as well as multiple other people. Their investigation is still ongoing, but so far, they're likely to receive tens of thousands in fines or possible jail time. The guy isn't getting deported because the government would have to pay for it and proceedings take longer than his remaining visa time, but now he's being upgraded from a flagged file to a multi-year ban on re-entry to my country. If he bothers me again though, he will be deported as well. Hope he enjoys going back to his angry wife and the ridicule from everyone he knows. See you again, never. Assuming his roommates aren't pulling the same stunt, I feel bad for them being collateral damage in all of this. It's one thing to go after him, it's another thing to cause a domino effect, which affects others who didn't do anything to her. Yeah, she thinks she did something good. She ruined more lives than just his. Some of those people could have been people trying to make ends meet and trying to better their lives given the hand they were dealt in life. My ex-girlfriend broke up with me and is now dating my boss. My ex and I broke up around four months ago after dating for a little over a year. She was the one who broke up with me, but at the time I agreed that it was for the best, so we ended things on good terms. We're pretty chill now and we have mutual friends, so we often all hang out together. So things between us are chill and friendly. I work at a research lab at my university and I just recently landed the position after a pretty long and competitive application process. I met my boss, who's a grad student, and we became buddies pretty fast. He's a really nice and funny dude that knows what he's doing. I see him every day since me and two other undergrads work under him and help with his research while he helps with our own. Fast forward about two weeks and I see on my ex's Snapchat story a picture of my boss with a heart emoji. I'm shocked, so I reply to her story asking her who her new boyfriend is and sure enough, she tells me she's dating my boss. I feign happiness for her and I don't tell her that he's actually my boss or that I know him in that way. But darn, I felt horrible. I thought I didn't have feelings for her after our breakup, but after seeing her story, I was just hit with a pang of jealousy. Maybe it's because he's a major step up for me. I'm a poor, disorganized undergrad, and he's a successful young talent who has his stuff together. The next day at work, I'm basically on edge the whole day. I would look at my boss, remember that he's dating my ex, and just feel so uncomfortable. The rest of the week was like that too. I stopped joking around with him and kind of just stopped talking in general to him. Now I dread seeing him every day because the fact that he's my boss, so he orders me around, it just makes me feel even worse and more below him. He's got the girl and I've got no one. I still love my job though and I worked hard to get it so I'm not planning on leaving. 
I also feel like a crappy person since my boss has been nothing less of nice and is honestly a great guy. Now I just feel like I should have tried harder in our relationship because she was perfect in every way and I just let it all slip through. The other day she came over to have lunch with him during his lunch break and I saw them laughing together. And yeah, another wave of sadness and jealousy. What do I even do now? How do I stop feeling like this? How should I normalize the situation at work? Update. For the past week, I've been trying to focus on myself and my work and not care about my ex and my boss who's dating her. It's worked pretty well. I started a painting and I'm pretty close to finishing it and I impressed my boss's boss, the professor who owns the lab, not the one dating my ex, by staying late for two days in a row to finish a really difficult experiment. During our lab meeting, my boss's boss shouted me out in front of the entire lab and said he was really impressed by my hard work and dedication. That felt good. As for the situation with my boss and my ex, he found out. Like I mentioned in my previous post, when my ex told me who her new boyfriend was, I didn't mention that he was my boss, so neither of them knew. Two days ago, my boss and us, two other undergrads, were in a conference room discussing a paper when my ex walked in. She came to drop off my boss's wallet that I think he forgot or something. Anyway, she saw me, did a double take, and went, Jake? She was definitely super surprised and caught off guard, and my boss was already confused, so I was just like, hey Sarah. She shot me another shocked, wide-eyed look and left. Suffice to say, the rest of the meeting was pretty awkward. The next day, it was obvious that my boss now knew our history. Things just turned so awkward, like he didn't know how to act around me anymore or what to say. Now we're both awkward around each other. He's still nice and all, but things are just uncomfortable between us two now. It's not his fault though. I think that things will get better between the two of us, but as of right now, I actually feel kind of relieved that he knows. Something about how both of us now don't know how to act and what to do kind of makes me feel reassured. Sarah also called me the night that she found out I worked there, but I missed her call and forgot to call her back. It's good though. I've been trying to think of her less and distance myself a bit. But if things continue to remain really awkward to the point where both of our work is affected, I'll consider talking to my boss's boss about switching me to work under another grad student instead. But yeah, that's about it. Thanks for the help. I'm actually glad you didn't answer your ex's phone call or return it. I can't imagine for the life of me any usefulness to that conversation. I mean, did she not know anything about the department you were in at school? Or the likelihood of seeing you if she kept her dating pool there? In my humble opinion, you really demonstrated an ability to be above drama by not immediately telling your boss or Sarah about your previous relationship. And I'm super stoked that instead, you just focused on your work and got praised by your boss's boss. Good for you. OP. Actually, me too. We're still friends and all, but I think I really need to put some distance between us and focus on myself for now. I'm glad I missed the call too. I applied for the job after we broke up and never mentioned it to her, so I guess she never found out. Am I the jerk for leaving my wife at a party and going away solo when she was making me late? I'm 28. My wife, who's 27, graduated medical school in 2021. They had a graduation party since everyone had had their shots, but it was still pretty small due to what was going on at the time. You could only bring one guest and you had to socially distance. Her medical school decided to invite all of the lockdown graduates to this year's graduation event. They planned this all out pretty last minute, only giving three weeks notice that it was happening. But my wife was very excited about it. She gets paid crumbs and works long hours as a resident, so I get why she wanted to relax and have fun. The issue is that I had a huge work trip the next day that had been planned for months. I don't travel a lot for work, so they went all out to make this comfortable and I had a lot riding on it. If I didn't do well, I would probably get fired, but if I did do well, there were two open positions I could be promoted to. My wife wanted to come with me, so my company comped her flight and we were going to make a vacation out of it after my presentations. We were flying out the night of the party to ensure I made it on time for the meetings the next day. I told my wife we shouldn't go to the redo event since we had to fly out and since it would be very tight. She insisted we go since the party started at 3pm and our flight left at 9pm, but the event was one and a half hours away from the airport. We made a plan to leave at 5.30pm pack everything in our car beforehand so we could go straight to the airport. But by 5.30, she just started saying goodbye. I told her we needed to leave ASAP, but she said no, we don't have to be two hours early for our flight, etc. Around 6 p.m., this guy from med school, who had a crush and asked her out multiple times, grabbed her hand and pulled her off to another table. I went up to them and told him he needed to back off. He said I needed to treat her better and let her enjoy herself. 
I looked at my wife, but she just ignored me. At that point, I decided I wasn't going to try and convince her to stick to her word anymore. I told her I was leaving for the airport and I took our car. There was a ton of traffic and security was a mess, so I only had a few minutes to spare before getting on the plane. She texted me horrible things. I never responded or engaged, but she kept texting me how I was horrible and don't understand what it's like to have a lockdown ruin a huge moment for you. I disagree. She still had a graduation party. It's not my fault she didn't get to dance. I don't see what the huge deal was and conversely think she didn't understand that this would cost me my job if I missed the flight. And since I make up around 70% of our income in a high cost of living area, we would essentially be homeless. We've been on tense terms since this happened in June. She brings it up a lot and is recommending therapy so I can learn how to behave in a marriage. But I don't think we need it since she's the one who caused this whole problem in the first place and should take accountability for that. But am I way off here? Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. You needed to catch the flight and not risk your job. She was being immature, wanting to party without managing her time. Not the jerk. You told her you were leaving for the airport. She didn't respond and didn't come. You guys also made detailed plans about when to leave and why. Your work trip is financially important and if you do end up going to therapy together, you'll probably find that your side gets more support than you're expecting. She was also pretty disrespectful by ignoring you when some dude made snide comments about how you treat your wife. I would expect her to shut him up no matter how she felt because that's how people behave in a marriage. But you really should respond if she texts you nasty stuff. Even just a, we will have to talk about this later, I'm in a hurry to get on a plane, I couldn't wait and miss the plane and I'm hurt that you disregarded our careful plans in order to party. Not the jerk. You compromised. She just did whatever she wanted regardless of what she promised and uncaring of any bind she was putting you in. Does she have a history of blaming others when she's in the wrong? If it's habitual, I'd leave. If this is the first time, do marriage counseling to see if having a third party back you up gets through to her. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. I know Reddit is infamous for jumping to the divorce solution, but bruh, if my spouse ever disrespected me like that at a party, it would be so over. I overheard my boyfriend making fun of the gifts I gave him. It's making me rethink about our relationship. I, 22 female, have been dating my boyfriend who's 27 male for 4 years now. His birthday was a few days ago. I always struggled with giving gifts to him because he's way more financially stable than I am. I'm saving up for my post-graduation degree, so money has been tight now. I decided to be creative about my gifts. I always had interest in arts and do-it-yourself projects. My boyfriend likes the stuff I make, crochet, etc. My boyfriend likes the stuff that I make when I crochet. So, I made a crochet doll of both of us hugging. The only expensive thing I got for him was a sunglass, which was $50. Other than that, I made a scrapbook of all of our pictures together and some boxes filled with love notes. That's all I could afford right now. But when he saw those gifts, he told me that they were the best gifts someone had ever given to him. I never had any indication that he disliked them. Yesterday, I was with him. My laptop broke down, so I borrowed his for a school project. He was logged into his messenger account. I saw a message pop up from his friend, Becky. Becky said something about, Please tell me you threw away that hideous doll. I know I'm wrong for snooping, but curiosity got the better of me. I saw chats from him and Becky making fun of the gifts that I gave him. He called me cheap and grandma because who in this generation does crocheting? It's not like he can use it in real life. He even disliked the sunglasses. Becky was instigating it even more. She had some of the most cruel comments and my boyfriend was agreeing with her. I also saw how much he praised Becky for giving him a VR gaming set. I felt so betrayed. Sure, my gift was cheap, but I spent time making it and organizing them. I did confront him about it. He just said I'm being dramatic over a gift. I've never been so hurt in my life. I don't know if what I'm feeling is right or not. I'm rethinking our relationship now. Like, he knows that the money is tight for me right now, but he claims if I love him enough, I would sacrifice a bit just to shower him with gifts. Taking out hundreds of dollars out of my savings just for one time wouldn't have been a big deal. Am I wrong here? Definitely time to reevaluate this relationship. Him talking smack on you and your gifts was wrong and uncalled for, especially being together four years now. And instead of defending you to his friend, he joined in on the crap talking. Is that the kind of guy you want to be with? OP, that's where I'm torn. I was not really in a financially better position when I met him. He let me borrow his car countless times. He even paid for some of my stuff when I was jobless during lockdown. I feel guilty because I can't give him back the same level of support that he's given me. 
I try to understand his side. I mean, in his mind, he must be thinking, I had supported her so much, but she doesn't show me the same level of support. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to feel sad about it because it was cheap. His friends gave him gifts that were somewhat expensive for my standard. He must feel humiliated by my gifts. Did you call your handmade crochet project cheap? How could you say that? As a crocheter, I know we can underprice our work, but crocheting cannot be replicated by machine. Every single crochet object has to be made by hand. You really need to look online how much crochet sells for. I'll give you a hint. These dolls get paid by the hour. They're sold so highly because of the expertise and time spent on these precious items. If you take three hours at a minimum wage, you're looking at $21. Does that seem high? Maybe depending on the person, but a true art enjoyer understands why. Respect yourself and your craft. OP. I mean, it took me two weeks to complete it. I know it's too long, but I never had the time. Also, the materials were free because my aunt gifted me a new set of crochet materials last year. I don't crochet that often, but I do make a lot of handy crafts made from scraps. So in that sense, it is cheap because I didn't buy all of the things myself. Update. I broke up with him. That's it. I know my worth. I've talked to him about my feelings and he did apologize for being a jerk, but it wasn't enough. We argued. We fought a lot, but the conclusion is that he treated me like crap even after I poured my heart into making those gifts. I asked him why did he praise Becky's gift way more than he did mine. He told me because Becky's gift was way more expensive. I asked him if he was cheating on me with her. He lashed out and screamed at me and said no. I know the truth now, even if he doesn't say it out loud. I packed my stuff and left his place. I'm staying with a friend of mine. I've been crying a lot. My friends have been really supportive of me. I asked him to give me back the doll because he's not worth having my dolls. I will sell this one and hopefully one day make dolls for someone who appreciates them. I'm really sad and lonely now. I really loved him. I pictured our life together. I even drew an anime version of us and our future kids. He did try to call me and tell me that I'm making a huge mistake. All his friends were trying to get us back together. Even that jerk Becky. I blocked all of them. I guess you can say I got the sweater curse because last year I knitted him a sweater and after one year we're broken up. I didn't believe in the sweater curse until now. Edit. For those who don't know, sweater curse is a superstition that when you knit a sweater for your significant other, you will break up or divorce within one year. But it's a myth as far as I know. Why is it that whenever someone breaks up with someone, the other person that got broken up with is the one that says, you're making a big mistake? Like no dude, the mistake was that I didn't break up with you sooner. Poor OP. Handmade gifts are always so thoughtful and unique. I hope she'll find someone that will appreciate her. Am I the jerk for being embarrassed with my cheapskate boyfriend? We've been dating for about four months and mostly it's been good. He's cute, smart, and very successful. The only downside is that he's almost addicted to buying things that are on sale or have coupons despite being a VP at his company. I'm not talking about sometimes or even most of the time. I would be alright with that. He never buys anything at full price. Ever. He plans his cooking around what's on sale that week at the grocery store. All of his clothes were bought on sale or clearance, even his socks and boxers. Last week, we were at my friend's house for dinner and she commented on his shirt. He proudly said that he got it on clearance last year for $20. I was mortified. Lastly, we don't go to any restaurants unless he finds a coupon or they're running some kind of a special. Things came to a head last night when we went out for dinner. He had a digital coupon for buy one get one free. For some reason, the restaurant's computer didn't recognize the deal and the poor cashier couldn't make it work. We were holding up the crowded line because he refused to pay for both dinners. Finally, the cashier called the manager, but he was busy somewhere else in the restaurant. While we waited, the people behind us were getting annoyed. I was so embarrassed, I left him standing in line by himself and I went to the car. We argued the entire drive home. We were supposed to go to the movies because he got free tickets, but I wasn't in the mood, so he dropped me off. We haven't texted today at all. When I talked to my friends at brunch, they didn't see a problem with it, and I found it frustrating that they didn't understand how embarrassing it is. Am I the jerk, or is this normal? He never buys anything at full price, ever? What's so terrible about that? As long as he's never rude or demanding to retail staff, he's smart to chase the best deals on everything. He proudly said he got it on clearance last year for $20? You were mortified? Why? I doubt your friend thought any less of him for it. And the fact the computer didn't recognize the deal wasn't his fault. He had the coupon. He ate there with the expectation that the coupon would be honored. As long as he was patient and not rude to the cashier, he did nothing wrong. 
If the people standing behind him were annoyed, they should have been annoyed at the restaurant management, not him. Overall, this sounds very much like a you problem, not a him problem. And calling him a cheapskate? You've been dating four months. I can't see this relationship lasting if you continue with that attitude. You're the jerk. You're the jerk. I spent most of the post thinking not the jerk, but you're really judgy of him. There's nothing embarrassing about mentioning a good deal on a shirt that someone complimented. Also, I missed the part where you were so embarrassed that you just paid the bill instead of walking away. No jerks here. You guys are just incompatible. He's not wrong for wanting to save. You're not wrong for not wanting to hold up a gigantic line of people for a coupon. Just different life approaches. And you will drive each other nuts with this if you don't discuss and come up with a compromise. Maybe his clothes and groceries are free for all couponing, but occasionally dinners out can be full price. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. There's two types of people in this world. Those who like to save money and those who like to waste it. I ruined my boss's life. A few years ago, I worked for a couple of months in a pastry shop. To work there, my boss promised me 8 hours a day except Mondays, half day, and Thursdays closed, and 700 euros a month. Obviously all off of the books. Although I had some resentment about working off the books, I accepted anyway because I needed some money. The first day of work, I was in there for 11 hours, from 5.30am to 1.30pm, and then from 3pm to 6pm. I thought it was normal since it was my first day, even if in reality some doubts came to me right away because all the others had been there as much as me, and for them, it was certainly not the first day. The situation continued to be this, ranging hours from 10 to sometimes 13 hours a day. Furthermore, for two weeks in a row on Monday, the day which we were supposed to only work in the morning, we instead worked with the schedule of the other days. At the end of the month, I asked for my well-deserved salary and my boss got angry, telling me that I was only thinking about money, when in reality, I hadn't even asked him to pay me for the multiple hours of overtime. He then told me that he would pay everyone at the end of the first week of the following month. The following day, after working as usual for 11 hours, at the end of the shift, he called me aside, telling me that since I had been presumptuous, I had to show up for work on Thursday, even though it was my day off. Obviously, I got angry and replied that I had worked much longer hours than those agreed upon and that I would not show up for work on my day off, and so I didn't. Thursday came around and I didn't show up, ignoring hundreds of calls from my boss and his wife. The next day, I showed up for work regularly and was severely reprimanded and then sent home for bad behavior. He told me that we would meet on Sunday to give me the money and I didn't have to show up again, which I already wasn't going to. So Sunday arrived and he showed up with 300 euros, telling me that I had done little this month and that I hadn't been respectful towards him and his business. I got very angry and also went to call my father who was waiting for me in the car. The two almost came to blows. So I took my father and we left, saying it wasn't over there. I kept in touch with some of my colleagues with whom I had established a good relationship with and who were also working for him under the table. They told me that the next day, he had badmouthed me by saying that I was a person without any form of respect and dignity. They had witnessed the scene the previous Friday and were speechless. They thought I had to do something and not let him walk all over me like this, and they were right. So I decided to do something that no one had ever had the courage or the will to do. I went to finance to denounce the fact that he had made most of his employees work illegally and that he exploited them by underpaying them. Obviously not alone, but with my colleagues, who were also tired of this, to support me. So we decided on a day and time for a pop check and waited. The agreed day was Saturday morning from 9 to 10, the day and time when there was usually more workload. It goes without saying that, contrary to what is thought of in Italy, sometimes justice works, and that day, finance, with a surprise check, discovered the whole situation and immediately closed the business. Subsequently, the owner, as well as my former boss, was investigated and sentenced to I don't remember how many years in prison. The business was seized and now his family is having to pay more than a million euros in tax evasion for other reasons related to false receipts and other things that I don't quite understand. My husband of 16 years is having a baby and it's not mine. I, 46 female, have lived with my husband, 48 male, for over 20 years, married for 16 and we have two kids who are 16 and 9. One year ago, he decided that he had had enough of his family life and went to live with his parents for some time. He was behaving like a bachelor for the entirety of his stay with them, found a girlfriend and was drinking all the time. He also spent a lot of his time playing games with friends on his computer. One year ago, he informed me that he found a girlfriend 
and was ready to move out of our apartment and cut ties, although he didn't quite do that. He left me, making close to minimum wage, to care for our two kids, and also left a collection of unpaid bills going back months. After that, I fell into a depressive episode that lasted two months, and my two close friends managed to get me out of it. About three months after he left us, he came back. Well, not really. He started coming to our city, hanging out with the kids again, and also with me, inviting me out for drinks and dinner. All was going well, and my 16-year-old went on a week-long trip with him. For a while, all was going well. He said that the girlfriend was a lie, and he just needed some time away to clear his head. Last night, I sent him a, good night, love you, text as I usually do, but in the morning, he replied with, I don't deserve your love. I'm about to become a dad again. I'm sorry. I later called him to ask what he meant by that, and he told me that he has a girlfriend in another country who's pregnant with his kid. She plans to keep it, and he wants to cut ties with me and our kids to care for that kid. I don't know what to do. I requested divorce, but he declined, saying he wasn't ready for that. Can anyone give me advice regarding this situation? Can I divorce him anyways, even though he doesn't want to? Is there any other way I can secure payment for my kids, since with only my job, I can barely make ends meet for the basics? I do some odd jobs here and there, but it's not enough. Speak with an attorney ASAP. He doesn't want a divorce because he doesn't want to help with the kids. File for divorce and request child support and alimony. Even if you guys are split up, why isn't he financially contributing to your kids' needs? He doesn't get to just up and leave and have you deal with everything. If he wants to leave, then adios, but he has to financially support and assist. You need to talk to someone to take the next steps. Ask the friends that helped you before to navigate the lawyer process with you. Forget that guy. He's a loser. My neighbor keeps letting her kid trespass on my land, so I called the police. I, 26 female, live in England. I own my own home and understand that I'm fortunate, but I also worked hard for it. Any money I received or earned while working part-time till graduation went into my savings account. Most people on my street are social housing tenants. I'm still determining what that is, but they've explained that you're eligible for this scheme if you're on a low income. It's more secure than the private sector as you mostly get assured tenancies, even though they are different tenancy types. For a while, I got on well with my next door neighbors, Emily and Ben. They also have three kids who are 13, 9, and 4. But soon, I started experiencing a lot of problems from next door. I work from home often and I could hear shouting next door consistently. Ben is 5'11", 145 kilograms, and quite loud and intimidating. Alexa, what is 145 kilograms in pounds? 145 kilograms is about 320 pounds. And quite loud and intimidating, and I constantly heard their kids screaming. I had to ask them to lower their voices daily, and I even explained that I work from home. The next set of problems revolved around their 13-year-old son. I spotted him climbing over a wall to get into my garden to get his football back, which at first I just ignored. Then after it happened 10 times, I finally decided to speak with his parents, and I can't remember what I said entirely. Still, it was something like, Hey, I just wanted to have a word as I've seen your son trespass 11 times to get his ball from my garden. I would appreciate it if you could get him to stop as he's trespassing, and if he just came around to the front and knocked on my door and asked for his ball back, I would be happy to collect it for him. The neighbors apologized and said they would make sure their son doesn't do it again and that he knocks. A few days later, their son did it again while I was in my lounge. I walked into my garden, which made him jump, and spoke with him. I told him I had seen him trespass to collect his ball on various occasions. I told him I had talked with his parents and that trespassing is a crime and I would appreciate it if you would just come to the front door and knock in the future. He didn't say anything and just went back into his garden. I informed his parents and they apologized, but it continued. I got fed up with it and decided to invest in some security cameras. I wrote a letter to residents on my road to give them a week's notice that security cameras were being installed at my address and it will cover my entire garden and it will also cover my doorway. I also wrote that I'm getting a ring doorbell camera. After installing the cameras, I thought it would stop the kids from trespassing, but it continued. I saved the footage, filed a police report against the son for trespassing and sent all of my evidence to the cops. I knew there was a strong chance that nothing was going to happen, but I just wanted the son to have some responsibility. When my neighbors found out, they were furious with me and since then our relationship has soured. My siblings found out about it and they think I'm a total jerk for this. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. You sound like an awful person to have in the neighborhood. Calling the cops on a kid getting his football? Also, why did you put in the part about the council houses when it has no relevance at all? 
admit that you feel better than these people. Low income housing isn't a scheme. It keeps lower income people, usually families, from being homeless. Legally, you aren't the jerk, but as a neighbor, you really are. This kid sounds like he has a rough home life and is just getting his ball out of your garden. He probably doesn't want to talk to any adults in his life at all, much less the guy who keeps complaining about him to his parents. If he's not wrecking anything in your garden, you're the jerk for making his life harder. Why do you put negative connotation to the word scheme? Scheme is a system. Social housing is a scheme. Or there might be some discrepancy between US and UK understanding of the word. It is a US and UK difference. In the US, the word scheme definitely has negative connotations. It's a kid in his ball. Good lord, lady. When I was 10, I was bigger than when I was 9. I hit a ball straight into Mr. Russo's sedan, cracked a headlight, furthest I ever hit a ball. I was so proud for about half a second. I waited for him, came to him and said, sorry, not to tell my dad and I would pay for it. This Vietnam Marine with a glare that would scare Medusa looks me dead in the eye without a hint of emotion and says, no more hitting in this direction, bat the other way, which made sense given the layout of the neighborhood. Never spoke about it again. Fast forward 25 years and I see Mr. Russo outside when I'm visiting my parents for a month. We chat. One day I asked him about the headlight and he said something I'll never forget. Want to be a good neighbor? Don't ever be the reason a kid feels like they can't have fun in their neighborhood. And never give out crappy Halloween candy. You're the jerk. Karen mother-in-law demands I stop playing video games. I, 27 female, and my husband, 26 male, are big gaming addicts. Our parents hate that we played video games, and we've gotten in multiple fights as kids and as adults over our hobby. It's a sore subject in our family, and we've opted to lie and say we are outside if anyone asks what we're doing. We both work from home, and right after, we proceed to play video games until midnight. None of us like leaving the house, so we're practically next to each other 95% of the time. There is no humanly possible way for either of us to cheat on one another. I'm currently pregnant, and this has caused our in-laws to visit very frequently. Due to this increase in visits, we've reduced much of our gaming time for the better health of the baby and so they don't see us gaming. We've gotten in arguments about how our hobbies are unacceptable, childish, and that we needed to change. Sundays are known to everyone as the unavailable day. We always say we are on a date or something, but in reality, we're at home getting our weekly gaming quota covered. My husband went to a gaming cafe with friends visiting, and I stayed home last Sunday. Mother-in-law decided later to call me in the middle of a match, and I suppose I was acting very suspicious because I wanted to end the conversation ASAP. She asked what I was doing, and I replied automatically without thinking that I was on a date with my husband. According to my husband, she then later called him, and he said that he was at a bar with friends. Mother-in-law decided to visit my house, where I was undoubtedly in the middle of another game. I avoided any phone calls and pretended to not hear the knocking until my match was over, 20 minutes or so. Afterwards, I answered the door and pretended that I was sleeping, which is why I wasn't answering the phone or door. Mother-in-law exploded on me, calling me a cheater and said that the child I was pregnant with was not her son's, because otherwise, why would I not answer the door? The idea that I would cheat and that it would even be possible to cheat on my partner was so hilarious to me that I burst out laughing, which angered mother-in-law even more. She continued to berate me while I just smiled sitting there, thinking how ridiculous all this was. When my husband came home, she berated me in front of him about how I was cheating on him. My husband was visibly confused the whole time and confirmed with his mother that there was no possible way for me to cheat on him. He explained how we are together practically every moment of the day and when mother-in-law saw he was not getting on her side, she proceeded to get mad at me for leading her on. She called me a jerk for pretending to have an affair and never correcting her before she told other people. Although I never clarified that I wasn't cheating, I do think that it was not her place to come unannounced and proclaim that I'm a cheater. Am I the jerk? Stop letting this jerk through your front door. Not the jerk, of course. Not the jerk, and your mother-in-law sounds toxic. Your gaming is your business. You both need to tell your parents that it's not their business and to keep their opinions on your gaming to themselves and enforce it. If they start bothering you about it on the phone, hang up. If they start when you're at their house, leave. If at your house, tell them to leave. You are adults. Info. You do realize there is no law that says you have to ever speak to this dreadful person ever again, right? You're the jerk.
His mother loves her son and realizes that he's wasting his life away rotting in front of a TV screen. I imagine she resents you because instead of helping him become anything that a man should be, you're encouraging him to continue being a man-child who spends an unhealthy amount of time playing video games. As parents, we want to see our kids become something in the world. It sounds like he's a major disappointment to her, and you are a part of that disappointment. What is your kid supposed to think as they grow up to see you two playing video games all day? I know everyone here is telling you that you're in the right and mother-in-law is a monster, but I honestly feel sorry for her and hope she goes no contact with you. Speaking of video games, do you ever play video games? And if so, which ones? Please let us know. If you play Fortnite, there's a good chance I've taken you out before. Am I the jerk for making my daughter share presents with my stepdaughter? I, 40 female, was a single mother to my daughter, Amy, who's 15. I married my wife, Jenna, 42, last year. She has a daughter, Nora, who's 13. We all live together as I have full custody of my daughter. It was kind of hard for the kids to adjust, but they got along well. The girls have their birthdays very close, only two days apart, so we decided to have a joint birthday party for both of them. Since Nora had a hard time making new friends, they moved in with us, and she's very shy. Most of my family lives out of the country, so the gifts were sent a week early. It was a huge bag with at least 20 gifts. The party was nice, and we opened the bag at night once everyone left. Jenna handed out the presents as she took them out. After 12 gifts in a row just for Amy, I checked the bag and froze to see that there was only one gift for Nora from my parents. She pretended it wasn't a big deal, but as she opened the present, I saw her eyes drop. It was a $15 tumbler from Walmart. Not to sound ungrateful, but Amy's gifts were much more expensive. Lots of gift cards over $100, a new phone, limited edition Funkos, designer clothes, and lots of cards wishing her a happy birthday. Needless to say, I blew up the family chat, calling out my parents, siblings, and extended family who sent gifts for not considering Nora and my parents for the cheap gift. No one took me seriously since it's not our duty to give gifts to someone else's kid and Amy deserved them since I didn't even throw her her own birthday party, emphasizing that Jenna and Nora are my problem and not theirs. Nora was clearly hurt since it's not the first time my family has left her out. At night, I asked Amy to share some of the gifts with her stepsister. Not all of them, just a couple of gift cards and some of the new clothes. Amy refused. This surprised me, since she never had a problem with sharing, and even though she and Nora are not BFFs, they usually get along. After asking why, Amy started crying, saying that she never wanted a joint birthday party, and that I force her to share everything with Nora. They share a room for space, and I make sure they're both invited to the same parties and sleepovers, so that Nora won't be left out. If they don't invite both of them, then neither of them goes. Amy stated that she at least wanted her own gifts to be hers alone. I scolded her for being selfish with her stepsister, grounded her, and took a couple of the presents to give to Nora. She turned them down because she didn't want problems with Amy and it felt like pity. Since then, Amy has been cold to all of us. I just wanted my two girls to be closer with the joint party and have the same things. Am I the jerk? Clarification. Jenna and I bought gifts for the girls, their own tablets, as well as their friends. Nora also received gifts from her extended family, but they sent for Amy as well. You're the jerk. You're basically asking your daughter to share her complete identity with Nora. Her room, her stuff, her family, her friends, her birthday party, the party she goes to, and sleepovers. Is there anything that's really hers? This can't be good for her development. She needs to be her own person. Yes, and Nora needs that too. How will she ever be able to be her own person and build her own relationships if everything in her life is based on a stepsister who barely seems to like her? To be fair, the girls might genuinely get along with each other, considering that they're close in age and are going through the same situation of having to adapt to the new reality. At some level, I do think they understand each other. Nora had to leave behind her own life, room, and friends. Amy is also aware of this, and now she's watching her stepsister being forced to make similar sacrifices. Amy isn't allowed to have her own friends? You seriously don't let her socialize unless her sister is with her? Not to mention, maybe Nora doesn't want Amy there when she hangs out with her friends. Sounds like Amy has nothing to herself, and she can't even go out with her friends on her own. Do you see Amy's struggles at all? Or are you so focused on the pretty picture in your mind and being Nora's hero that you don't see all the changes your own daughter is going through? 
You have compassion for Nora, and that's wonderful, but you are sacrificing your own daughter's happiness for Nora's. Just because Amy doesn't complain doesn't mean she isn't struggling and hurting. Yes, your parents are jerks. That was a horrible thing to do. But maybe they did her a favor if it wakes you up to just how awful you are being to your daughter. I'm wondering if she's complained to them or they just see how she's treated now. But you tried to fix it and you totally did it the wrong way. You punished Amy for your family's awful behavior. Listen to what Amy is telling you. She's been polite long enough. You are not bringing them closer. You are driving them apart. You're the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for how she tried to handle this or not? Let us know right now. You can't force your kids to share everything. It never turns out good. My Karen neighbor is trying to get my dog taken away. I, 22 female, and my partner, male 24, purchased our first home in January of 2022, and we absolutely love the neighborhood and our direct neighbors who are right next door. We're the youngest couple in this area, with most of the people being older or retired. We also have no kids. We just have a two-year-old Siberian Husky who's my baby. The problems began as soon as we moved in with complaints piling in first about our lawn. The house was abandoned before we purchased it. Then there was a noise complaint about our dog. For a Husky, she barely makes any noise. So I was surprised about the complaint, but I just let it go. About nine months into living at the house, my partner purchased me an antique car which needed some work done before it could be driven. It was parked far into our long driveway, not yet tagged because we had just purchased it and one tire was off to be fixed. The very next day, we got a nasty letter on our door from the city about an inoperable vehicle on our property that must be removed. We found this very strange and after speaking with the inspector, who simply told us to move the car, we found out that there's a person in our neighborhood who keeps reporting us but remains anonymous. I got close with my closest neighbors and tried to ask them for advice on what to do. They both said the most likely person to be reporting us is the neighbor across from us, an old lady and her husband who live with their blinds wide open just looking outside 24-7. Their daughter, a Karen in the making, drives around the neighborhood looking for people to report. My partner and I just happened to become the latest victims and she apparently really hates us. I decided to just be nice to her and try to win her over with kindness. Big mistake. About two months ago, I fixed up my motorcycle and decided to take it out for a ride to enjoy the warm weather. While it idled in my driveway to warm up, while I geared up, I saw the daughter come by with her kid to my neighbors across the street. The kid seemed very interested in the bike, so I gave a little wave and hopped on the machine to ride off. I enjoyed the ride, and when I returned and parked the bike in my driveway to do some basic maintenance, a police officer rolled up to my house. He claimed there was a complaint out about me riding recklessly, doing wheelies and burnouts, and being a danger to the neighborhood. I was completely floored and tried to plead my case that I went for a ride and I didn't even stay in the neighborhood. He let me off with a warning and as he drove away, I noticed my neighbor standing at the window staring at me. From that point on, I decided to mind my own business and not act friendly to them. Fast forward to this past month. My partner and I had to travel to New York for my family and we decided to take our dog with us. We had a wonderful time and when we got back to our home, we only had four days to wash clothes and repack before heading off to California for more family time. Within those four days, my partner worked days and I worked nights so that our dog was never left alone. Trust me, this becomes important. Three days ago, I dropped my dog off with a trusted friend whose dog always plays with mine. I paid her $800 to watch my dog at her house for two weeks. My home is empty at this point and I fly to California to enjoy a relaxing vacation. I get video and photo updates of my dog playing and having a blast staying with my friend. This morning I get a text message from one of my good neighbors saying animal control stopped by my house and she asked me if my dog was okay. I was extremely confused because I had just gotten a photo of my dog cuddled up on my friend's couch. I decided to call the city and see what was up. The city told me that there were multiple reports against me for neglect and improper care of my dog and that a full investigation was going to be conducted against me. I was at a loss for words. I'm across the country right now and this neighbor has stepped too far trying to take my very spoiled and well cared for dog away from me. All my friends and next door neighbors can vouch for how loved this dog is. So now I'm waiting to hear back from animal control to explain my case. I have no idea what's going to happen next if they try to take my dog or inspect my house. I'm exhausted and tired of the harassment by this neighbor. I'm hesitant to get pregnant out of fear that this neighbor would call the authorities and lie about me. I feel watched and unwelcome and I'm not sure what to do. Any advice from those who have been through something similar is very appreciated. 
Is there anything legally I can do to make it stop? Update. My dog was taken to the shelter by my friend to be examined by a vet. They took photos as evidence but released my dog back to my friend. I have not heard anything new about the investigation yet. I also requested Freedom of Information Act from my city to read the anonymous email that was sent. I was told my request would take 5 days to process and may cost me a fee to have access to it. It also remains anonymous so I'll only be able to read what was written. Hopefully I can use the words to somehow prove it was them. This is really frustrating being far away and I feel like I'm being treated like a criminal. Thank you all for the advice. I'm installing cameras and a fence as soon as I get back. This is harassment. Please keep a journal with dates and times of neighbor actions. Then contact the lawyer for a cease and desist letter. Your lawyer can help guide you in the future. Entitled lady tries to force me to leave a public lake. I force her to leave instead. This was a few years ago. I used to work as a detective for a local police department. I'm retired now, and this occurred when I was still employed there. In my life, I've always made every attempt to stay on the right side of the law, as I consider hypocrisy one of the worst traits for an officer of the law to have. I owned a nice ski boat, and in my spare time, I enjoyed taking my family to the local public lake to use the boat and tube, water ski, swim, etc. My kids were ages 12 and 13 at the time, and they really got a kick out of this. They wanted to go nearly every day off that I had, all summer long. One day, we were at the lake, and after a few hours, my daughter mentioned she needed to use the bathroom. The lake also had a public swimming beach that had public restrooms, and we would often take bathroom breaks there. We would pull up to the shore well away from the marked swimming area, and we'd disembark to use the facilities. One day, as we pulled up, I noticed a lady on a lounge chair, sunbathing on shore near where we pull a boat up. I stayed about 50 feet away from her, still about 250 feet away from the swimming area, as I slowly maneuvered the boat towards shore at idle. As I got close, she stood up and glared at me while my kids whispered to me that they knew her as a mean lunch lady from their previous elementary school. As I brought the boat up to shore, this woman started yelling very loudly that I was breaking the law. I smiled as friendly as I could and said, Really? What law? She continues yelling, saying that I was driving a motorboat in a swimming area. I pointed to the marked swimming area about 250 feet away and said, You mean that swimming area? To which she replied, Yes. I told her that I never entered or even got close to that swimming area and that my boat was right now as close as I got. She said the law prohibits boats from pulling up to any shore. Well, how are you supposed to get in and out of your boat then? And now she was calling her son, the deputy, who was going to get me in trouble. At this point, I was starting to enjoy this a little because I thought for sure her son, the deputy, would tell his mom that she couldn't stop me from pulling my boat up to shore. I stood nearby as she calls someone, assuming her son, on her cell phone. She then reads the person on the phone my boat hull number. It's like a license plate for boats. Then she says, with a smirk on her face, My son is going to order you from the lake, right now. And what happens next shocks me. This woman calls me by my full name. Then she hands me the phone. Now, I should say this. What has just happened is a clear violation of the law. In my state, it's known as a lien violation. And officers and deputies are very often charged with this crime. I read about it several times a year. If an officer uses his police computer to divulge personal information, say a deputy tells his mom the name of a registered owner of a boat that she's having a disagreement with, it's a crime. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Every cop knows this. So I take the phone. I immediately ask, who is this? I hear, this is deputy so-and-so of the county sheriff's office. And I immediately interrupt him and say, Deputy, do you know what a lien violation is? Several seconds of silence. Deputy so-and-so, I use his real name of course, are you still there? He says, yes. So I say it again. Deputy, let me ask you again. Do you know what a lien violation is? He stammers out a reply about bolt hull numbers and public records or something. I say, nope, that's not what a lien violation is. Since you don't know, do I need to remind your supervisor what a lien violation is? Again, silence. I then said, tell you what, I'm going to hand this phone back to your mother, then you're going to tell your mother to leave this beach right now, then we can all forget this ever happened. Understood? Long silence. Understood? He does a long exhale and says, yeah, okay. I hand the phone back to his mother, she whispers into the phone for a few seconds, then angrily snaps her phone shut. Without making eye contact, she packs up her stuff and is gone. I thought about reporting him anyway, but technically I was the victim. 
yet I wasn't feeling victimized at all, so I just let it go. Only one other time did I see the lady at that beach again, and as she saw me, she immediately packed up her stuff and left again. Edit. All citizens have rights, even cop citizens. When off-duty, I have a right to not report something that makes me a victim, if I so choose. But why? But now you're a hypocrite. Nope, we can all choose or not. We all have rights, and I will happily prosecute anyone when I'm truly victimized. I get to make the call. You really do need to have a conversation with his supervisor. He was attempting to use his position in law enforcement illegally. Yeah, I'd still report the deputy for misuse of the system. Might as well make an example out of him so others know not to mess around. Am I the jerk for taking a day off for myself without telling my husband? My husband, 38 male, and I, 40 female, have been married for 8 years and we have a 4-year-old son together. I work for a regional park district managing the outdoor recreation and education program. Basically, I work outside 90% of the time. The summer is by far my busiest time of the year and I routinely work 6 days a week. If I can make it work, I'll take a day off during the week to offset my hours because our weekend events are the ones I'm most needed at since they're bigger. I'm salaried, so don't get overtime. This is not new. I've been in this position since before my husband and I got married. He knows how busy I am this time of year. Since our son was born, my husband has gotten increasingly grumpy during this time of the year because he obviously has to be responsible for our son during the weekends when I work. We fought about this a number of times because he feels like I should talk to my bosses about getting other people to take over some of my weekend events so that he doesn't get stuck with our son by himself every weekend. I feel like he needs to suck it up because this is nothing new to anyone and it's only a small portion of the year that my schedule is like this. His argument is that there is nothing he does that leaves me parenting by myself for similar amounts of time and that there needs to be more of a balance in that area. This past weekend I had events on both Saturday and Sunday, full 8 hour days and outside in the heat. By the time I got home, both nights I was exhausted and just wanted to take a shower and go to sleep. I tried to watch a movie with them on Saturday night but fell asleep on the couch. Last night I crashed by 8 p.m. This morning I told my husband I was going to work from home for a bit in the morning to offset my hours. But after my husband took our son to daycare and I started looking at emails, I changed my mind to just take the day off and get some rest and maybe do a few things around the house. I must have fallen asleep on the couch because I woke up to my husband making himself lunch in the kitchen. He regularly comes home for lunch because his office is nearby. I asked him how his day was going and a few other questions and he kept giving me one word answers. I asked him if he was okay and he told me he was tired and feels like he hasn't gotten a break all summer and it's frustrating for him to come home and see me napping when I told him I was going to work from home. I told him I was still tired from the weekend and decided to take the day off. He said he's tired too and that I need to start doing a better job of taking his needs into consideration instead of just focusing on my own. He said it's not fair to him to work five days a week then be solo parent all weekend while all I do is work and sleep. I told him that summer is almost over so my weekends will be free again soon. But all he said was, since you're rested now, you can pick up son from daycare. I won't be home for dinner. You're the jerk. Not for the day off. Everyone should get one from time to time. You're the jerk because your husband is 100% parent during every weekend of the summer months, in addition to having a full-time job Monday through Friday. He's asked you to talk to your bosses about getting more people, but you've refused. So I guess this is life for him now. June through August, full-time parent every weekend. Also, all of the household chores on the weekend, cooking, mowing, etc., you've dumped too much on him and your answer is basically, get over it. You're the jerk. You don't refute what he said, that there are not times where you are solely picking up all parenting duties for him. He's not complaining about being a dad and parenting. He's upset that you're stretching yourself so thin that you can't be an equal partner and parent and are unwilling to even ask if it's possible for your responsibilities to be shifted so you can have the schedule your responsibilities require. If you were a man and he was a woman, nobody on this sub would be siding with you. I'm interested to know why you can't and won't try to delegate at work to alleviate some of this stress on your husband. Like, is it an income thing where you are the primary breadwinner and you can't afford to rock the boat at work? If so, how do you help him refill his emotional tank after your busy season? If I were him, I'd feel pretty taken for granted. Sounds like you're the jerk. You have a family now. You can't pretend you don't just because this is a busy time of the year. It's incredibly unfair to make your husband take on every weekend in the summer 
because your boss can't figure out how to keep employees and you won't put your foot down about an occasional weekend. It doesn't sound like Hubs is asking for every weekend just for you to give a little. You're willing to sacrifice your family for work. Are you willing to do a little of the reverse? You people on this sub are crazy sometimes. Plenty of women have the kids all weekend long and everyone just acts like it's fine. But when it's a man, it's poor dad can't handle it. It's not like this is a new thing. Dad knew full well what his wife's schedule was when they decided to have a kid. It's not like mom is gone for 15 hour days on weekends. I assume it's a normal eight hour work day. So dad is perfectly capable of taking care of his kid during that time. It's also only for a few months a year. Not everyone works a normal nine to five Monday through Friday. Dad can deal with it for a few months a year. It's called being a parent. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. I'm just glad we don't have kids, Reddit boy. And so many of these stories solidify my gratitude. Am I the jerk for saying I would stay at my mom's if I had to share a room with the babies? I'm 16, female. My parents split up before I was born. Custody is, I live with my dad most of the time and my mom every other weekend, plus random staying with her if I want to. Recently, my dad got engaged to Hannah and she and her kids are moving in. Hannah's kids are ages 9, 7, and triplets who are 2. She's widowed, so they live with her full time. This made room arrangements a bit awkward since there's only 3 rooms for the kids to go around. Dad and Hannah talked it over last night without consulting anybody and Hannah came over this morning to announce with my dad what they decided. Apparently, they want 9 and 7 to each have their own rooms and have me share with the triplets because my room is significantly bigger than the other ones and I don't stay there full time. I said their plan was stupid. They wanted me to share my room with three toddlers. They said they didn't want me to move, but it was the biggest room so other people should share. I said I didn't care if I switched rooms because the more logical move would have been the triplets in the big room, seven and nine share, and I get my own room. I said I'd take the smallest one until I want to move out. They said it would be more work to move my things to another room and their idea was more practical. They asked why I was so pressed since I don't even live here full time. I said not staying in the room four days a month was a sorry excuse to land me with a bunch of toddlers and if they seriously planned on doing this to me, I'd make the custody arrangements change and I'd stay with my mom for the most part. I know she doesn't mind because both of them remind me I could stay with her whenever I wanted. This made Hannah cry because she just wants her family to blend together nicely and apparently I was ruining her plans. This made dad mad at me and I'm not allowed to talk to Hannah until she forgives me. I didn't know this meant so much to them but I'm still saying I'll stay with my mom longer if I have to share room with the toddlers, but my dad just made me feel a bit guilty. So, am I the jerk? Update. I'm at my mom's house, at least for the weekend, while the adults try to work things out, but my mom said I was welcome to live with her full time, and if I really wanted, we could change the custody agreement. Also, thank you for your replies. I wasn't expecting this to get as much attention as it did. Update 2. Everyone talked but dad and Hannah are staying with their decision and I've decided to move to my mom's long term and we're going to switch the custody around so I'll only see my dad every other weekend and I'm just going to sleep on the couch when I'm there. Obviously nothing is set yet but that's what we're going to do and thanks everyone for being so nice. I'm pretty sure practical in this context means it's practical for the dad's fiance that OP shares a room with her three kids so she can take responsibility for them at night and the fiance won't have to anymore. And she's right, it would be extremely practical from the fiancé's selfish perspective. Neighbor says I was trying to cheat him out of my TV. I'm having a house build, but bought a TV during Amazon's Prime days. I had it sent to my grandparents' house to be stored until the house is done. The package never arrived, and after a couple days, the picture from the delivery finally appeared. I sent it to my grandfather, who recognized it as his neighbor. He calls the neighbor who claims that he ordered the same exact TV and didn't recognize he opened mine. The neighbor says his is coming the following week and will give me his, as it's the same exact TV. A few hours later he says, I called Amazon who said for me to keep the TV and for you to call them so they can replace it. I tell him that my refund and replacement have already been denied multiple times and that I was told to contact law enforcement but I would call again. The next morning I call Amazon who tells me that my claim was denied again and that I should still try to get my TV back since I know where it is. I call the neighbor who is now saying he has to send my TV back when he gets his in. I tell him not to, that I want my TV even if it's open. 
He's an old dude, so I was using yes sir and no sir. I was trying to be polite, as he has my expensive TV. He hangs up and sends me a long text about how he has my TV and won't be giving it back. And I just say, to verify, you're refusing to give me my TV. He calls me back and tells me to stop harassing him. So I drive over to my grandfather's house. He's out of town and I call the cops. After some back and forth phone calls with the cops calling me and the neighbor, they come out. Four cops showed up because the dude said I am committing fraud and cheating him out of a TV. After I showed the cops the text where he says he has my TV, pictures of the box he sent me with my name on it, and where my refund was denied, they went to go talk to him. He changed his story for the fifth time to say I already got a refund and that I'm trying to fraud Amazon. End of the day, I got my TV back and the neighbor calls my grandfather. Grandfather calls me saying that I discredited him. He meant defamation. He says that I called the cops on his neighbor and cheated him out of a TV. The neighbor is claiming he won't get his package now because he was supposed to keep mine. This old dude was so entitled, he thought he had a right to my TV. I don't think he even ordered one in the first place now. Edit. For those of you who are curious, the cops were only able to get it back because of our state laws. Nationally, there is no law that required him to give it back. Most states have this law. Karen gets me fired from a store I don't even work at. I used to work at a West Coast Division store of Kroger. My family has several pets and farm animals, so I routinely shop at a local farm store. Most of the time I did this after my shift ended, which means I'm in my work uniform. Black slacks, either a dark red polo shirt or a button-up gray shirt that have the store logos embroidered on them. The farm store personnel wear jeans, t-shirts, and gold-colored vests with the farm store logo. I was in the farm store looking at some electric fence supplies. This woman kept pestering me and asking me questions about some jeans she wanted to try on from the other side of the store. I politely pointed in the general direction of the clothing section. She stomped off. A couple minutes later, same woman is demanding I unlock the changing room for her. I'm rather irritated with her over-aggressive Karen attitude and snapped back. No, now go away and leave me alone. Again, she stomps off. I pick up a few items and start towards the checkout when I get ambushed by this same woman who now has the store manager in tow. She's demanding I apologize to her. The manager just shakes his head, then asks, Would you like to apologize to this customer? What for? She's rude, obnoxious, and irritating. No, I don't want to apologize. She screams, I've never been so humiliated in all my life. You need to fire him now. The manager is still shaking his head in disbelief when he says, Well, ma'am, I'm not going to be able to do that. And just why not? She demanded. The store manager is just standing there looking at her. I reply, Obviously, she isn't smart enough to figure out I don't work here. So save us both some time and fire me. Then maybe she will shut up and go away. You're fired! The manager barked, drawing even more attention from other customers in the store. I lean in closer to Karen and say, Are you happy now, ma'am? That's the third time he's fired me this week. Have a nice day. Thanks for shopping, Smith's Food and Drug. I walked away as everyone listening started to laugh. The manager hollers at me as I'm walking towards the registers. See you tomorrow? Yeah, I have to get hay and alfalfa. The woman threw down the jeans she was holding and ran out the doors. Am I the jerk for punishing my son by taking away his phone after he deleted my daughter's Minecraft world? I, 41 female, am married to my husband who's 42 male, and we have two kids. Our son, who's 11, we will call Zach, and daughter, who's 9, we will call Lizzie, not their real names. Lizzie loves the video game Minecraft, and she's played it nearly every day since we bought it for her on Xbox for her 8th birthday. She's a super artsy kid and loves to create extravagant buildings and structures in Minecraft, and she has shown me her amazing creations many times. Two days ago, she was playing downstairs, and Zach asked if he could play with her. Lizzie didn't let him play, even though we have two Xbox controllers, and Zach was very angry for her not letting him play. I don't know why Lizzie didn't let him play. I was in the kitchen upstairs. Yesterday, when my husband and I were still sleeping, Lizzie started screaming and crying downstairs. She always wakes up early to play. Her world with all of her creations was gone, and she told us between sobs that she can't get it back, and she thinks that Zack deleted it last night. When Zack woke up, I asked him if he deleted Lizzie's world, and he started laughing 
and said that she should have let him play with her. I was livid. Lizzie loves that game so much and her creations were beautiful and now they're gone forever. Not to mention that she's devastated that the world she has spent over a year on is gone forever. I took my son's brand new phone away. We had just bought it for him this month for his birthday. My son is acting like this is the end of the world. He says he needs his phone because everybody else at school has one and he needs to fit in. He's starting middle school this week and claims he doesn't want to become a social outcast. I told him he can have his phone back in a month and not having a phone won't make him an outcast, but he refuses and wants it now. My husband thinks that taking away his phone is going too far and that Lizzie's game being gone isn't that big of a deal. But by that logic, isn't Zach's phone being gone not that big of a deal either? I don't know what to do. It's been over 24 hours and Zach won't talk to me and Lizzie is still moody. So Reddit, can I get some advice? Am I the jerk? Not the jerk and hold your ground. I'm a parent who is skeptical of video games, but Minecraft is different. What your son did is the equivalent of destroying a carefully created painting made over several months and he laughs about it? Horrible. Or if she had a carefully crafted Lego world downstairs and came down to see it smashed. Not the jerk, and I do think Zach needs a harder lesson here. Lizzie needs her own private password. As a person who has carefully crafted Lego worlds, I concur. He should honestly be lucky that a phone takeaway was it. Not the jerk. You should keep his phone for as long as it takes your daughter to rebuild her world. Fair is fair. I would just add to it though. Until it takes her to rebuild her world and he's also remorseful for what he did. Just being punished without having any remorse accomplishes nothing and just makes him feel like a victim. He needs to understand what he did was wrong and until he sincerely is remorseful, he shouldn't get his phone back. OP's husband should spend a few hours with Lizzie and try to build a world himself. That would give him a taste of exactly what has been lost and the time and effort that was put into building her world. Well, what do you think? Should OP give her son his phone back or not? Please let us know. Absolutely not. He needs to learn a lesson. This reminds me of when I was little and my brother and I would delete each other's Zelda Ocarina of Time files when we got in a fight. Am I the jerk for paying for my daughter's college expenses, but not my son's? I can see both sides of the argument here, so I want some other advice. I have two kids, my daughter, Lily, and my son, Jim. Jim graduated high school this year and Lily is in her third year of college. For the past few months, I've gotten massive amounts of trouble from my ex-wife because I won't pay for Jim's college costs entirely like I currently do Lily's. Jim has not talked to me for over a month right now because of it. I feel like I'm 100% in the right because the situation with Jim is completely night and day compared to Lily. Lily graduated high school with a 4.0 GPA. She has always been incredibly gifted when it comes to academics. She got a full scholarship to a prestigious college and I cover her housing, school supplies, and expenses. Even with this, she works as a student employee as a lab tech to make money. Jim graduated this year with a 2.1 GPA. We didn't think he was going to graduate at all at the beginning of the year. He's never put school as a priority and for many months just stopped going entirely. I blame my ex for this as she let him get away with it. I didn't even know he applied for college until he announced that he got into the lowest ranking college in the state. I was happy for him, but the tuition for this college is insane. His mother and he assumed I would cover the tuition cost and living expenses like I do for Lily. I told him there's no way I would do that. His tuition alone for a single semester is more than I give Lily in a year, and with his past record of school, I would not be shelling the money out. I told him if he wants to go to a community college to get his generals out of the way, I would pay for that, but there is no way I'm supporting him, especially because I do not trust he would actually apply himself. Jim and his mother have made my life horrible since then. They've told me I'm playing favorites and making sure Jim has no chance to start his life off. I could theoretically afford the tuition, but there's no way I'm comfortable making the sacrifices to do so just to see if he likes college enough to pull C's like he did in high school. My family agrees with me and Lily herself told me she does not think I should support Jim because her support in no way even compares to what financial support Jim would need. Jim has gone no contact with me and my ex blows my phone up every few days telling me that I've crushed his hopes and dreams and that I can still make it right. I don't feel like I'm in the wrong here and there's no way I'm going to give him the money but I need to know if I'm in the wrong with my thinking. Edit. Clarification time. 
1. I do not pay Lily's tuition. She has a full scholarship. I give her maybe $11,000 a year as she works part-time as well and lives in relatively cheap housing. 2. Jim's tuition for an entire year would be $32,000. This would include another eleven dollars to $12,000 for housing and other things assuming he gets a job, which he said he didn't want to. 3. I'm willing to pay for community college or trade school and help him out if needed. This would be a fraction of the cost of college and allow him to prove to me he actually plans to try. If he got an associate's with good grades, then college financial support would be on the table. But considering he barely passed high school due to not applying himself, I doubt it. I'm willing to give him the exact amount of support I give Lily, but it won't be enough to get him to college. His mother cannot afford to help him and I doubt he will want to work for it. Not the jerk. There are two reasonable compromises and you've already offered one, paying for community college for a couple of years. The other one is paying the same amount as what Lily gets, which won't cover everything, and Jim or his mom can decide how to fund the rest. OP. Him not wanting to do community college is what really set me down the path of not wanting to pay. I don't pay for Lily's tuition and I don't want to pay $16,000 a semester alone for Jim's right now. I was willing to do community college for now to at least see if he would apply himself, but with how everything is playing out, my guess is that won't work out either. I've always believed when it comes to money, your money, your choice, so for that reason alone, not the jerk. Additionally, as someone who has the means to pay for the tuition, you probably know where your money is best invested, with education undeniably being a form of investment. Despite this take, however, I strongly advise that you have an open and civilized discussion with Jim about his options and find out what he actually wants from life. Sounds like he's missing direction, which is why he's been failing, whilst Lily knows what she wants. Jim deserves support to succeed, and that support might not mean expensive tuition, but something completely different. Best of luck. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for not wanting to pay his son's tuition or not? Please let us know. Not at all. I wouldn't want to flush my money down the toilet either. Oblivious customer thinks I'm rude. At my job at a big chain store, there's this work area where customers need to wait for us to get their stuff or do checkups of some of the more technical products. What often happens is that many customers tend to stand right in front of the entrance to this area while they wait, even though there's tons of room for them to stand. So we regularly have to ask people to move in order for us to, you know, be able to do our jobs. Now this one family, a woman, her husband, and their three kids were waiting for a colleague of mine to get their products, completely blocking the way. I needed to pass to get something for someone else and politely ask them to move. A minute later, I need to walk back out, and there they are again, cutting off my path. So once again, I have to ask them to move, this time adding they can wait a bit further. Two minutes later, you guessed it, the whole family casually standing there, blocking the whole entrance. This time I tell them we regularly need to pass through here and that I'd appreciate it if you could stand a bit further. Then the woman, clearly annoyed, says, You know, you really should be more polite to customers. How so? I ask. I just think you're impolite, talking to us like that. I'm not sure I understand, ma'am. How is what I said impolite? It's not what you said, it's the way you said it. Well, ma'am, I apologize if I appeared impolite. In my defense, I had to ask you to move three times, so yes, perhaps you detected a little frustration on my part. I'm sure if you have to tell your kids the same thing three times, you get a little frustrated as well. She didn't immediately know how to respond to that, and I looked at her husband, who wisely said nothing. Then, I extremely politely told her I had another customer waiting and that I needed to pass. The woman, however, decided she wasn't done with me yet. I find it extremely rude of you to bring my kids into this. This is very unprofessional of you. I just stared at her, as if to say, seriously? As a customer, she went on, I deserve to be treated with respect. And as a human, I deserve better than to be called rude by someone who clearly doesn't respect me or my job. You can't talk to me like that. I want to speak with your manager. No, you don't. He'll back me up and tell you to treat me with respect or leave. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm not going to argue with you anymore. I have a job to do and you're preventing me from doing it. I left and when I returned a few minutes later, they were gone. The manager part was a bluff though. He's new and I have no clue how he'd handle it. Everything is locked in the display case. I used to work for a national office supply store 15 years ago in the technology department for the afternoon shift. 
The way it worked was that the guy working mornings usually received the freight and would sort what could be placed directly on the shelf and what stuff needed to go into locked areas along with separating tech stuff from other office stuff. USB thumb drives at the time were like brand new and I remember a one gigabyte costing like $100, so stuff like that gets put in the locked display case. Usually by the time I got there, he was more than halfway done placing inventory where it needed to go. The first stuff to get put away was expensive items that needed to get locked up so a customer with sticky fingers wouldn't walk off with it. Anywho, morning guy quit and the store manager told me I was now responsible for his job and my job. I really gave it a go for about a week, hoping the manager would either hop in and help or they would have a replacement soon enough. Needless to say, it was total chaos and an impossible job. When we would leave at night, stuff just kept on accumulating from the previous days along with empty shelves. Then I got told that they hadn't even posted a job announcement and that they were not hiring a replacement. It was just me. Not okay. To make things worse, the manager has scolded me that there's stuff in boxes I haven't even had time to open that's out on the floor and the cart I used to transport that should have been locked away hours ago because somehow I'm a superhero and can do this even faster than when two employees are doing the job. Cue malicious compliance. I don't have time to sort out what needs to go where, so I open up the glass display case and just start chucking stuff in. Number two mechanical pencils? Yup, right next to those $100 thumb drives. Post-it notes? Yup, right next to that $1,000 Canon Rebel digital camera. White out naturally goes on top of the boxes for those expensive laptops in the case. I filled the display case to the brim and was only barely able to get the doors to slide closed and locked. Then I go on break. Manager has now noticed this problem and is lava level mad. I tell him everything is locked up just like he asked. And I tell him that unless he plans on hiring another employee, I wouldn't be working there anymore. He had another guy hired in two days. Funny how manager's attitude changes when they have to start doing the work. My Karen wife demanded I pay for her friend's bill at dinner. I, 24 male, and my wife, who's 24 female, are a newlywed couple. My wife has four friends who she has been really close with since high school. For a celebration, my wife decided to go to an expensive steakhouse. The day comes and we go in separate cars there. We all eat and my wife slides the bill, $700 plus, and proceeds to say, the man should always pay for the wife and her friends. I laugh awkwardly and ask her why. She says, because I'm the man. I tell her that the only other person I would be paying for would be you and me. Her friends proceeded to laugh at me, calling me a broke husband. I stand up and I put two $100 bills there for my wife and I's food and I leave. My wife gets home and she starts screaming at me, saying that I made her feel embarrassed, how she promised her friends I'd pay, and that her friends made fun of her on the ride home for marrying a man who can't even pay the bill. I decided to pack a bag and head to my friend's house. I told my parents and my friends, and they say that I should have just paid it. Now I'm having second thoughts if I overreacted. Am I the jerk? Edit. I've read some comments asking if my wife has ever acted like this before. And no, she hasn't. That's why I just laughed awkwardly. The only other time she did this was when I didn't pay for her mom's food, which happened when we first started dating, and it was the first time she ever screamed at me like that. Instead of escalating it, I just left. And when we do argue, it's not a screaming match. For how long we've dated... I've known her since freshman year of high school and we got together junior year. We've been together for over eight years. I read some comments and decided to talk to her tomorrow about what happened, why she did that, etc. I do recognize that I didn't pay the full amount of me and my wife's food. I do take fault for that. I should have added another $50 to $75 to make it the price of two people. For the people who say I forgot to tip, I go there regularly with my coworkers. We each pay for our own plate and I always leave a good tip. Not the jerk. Your wife should have talked to you about it before telling her friends that you'd pay, not assume. Dude, everyone in this scenario is a jerk except for you. Wow, the audacity to just casually push over $700 bill and then say, well, the man should always pay for his wife and her friends. It sounds to me like your wife doesn't want a spouse. She wants a sugar daddy who will treat her and her friends. And when you pushed back, she blew up in an attempt to manipulate the situation in her favor by playing on your emotions. You embarrassed me. Your family and friends must think that emotional and financial mistreatment, guilting you and trying to force you to pay for her and her friend's food with no prior warning, is cool. Get better friends and seek marriage counseling or a divorce if this is frequent behavior. Not the jerk in the slightest.
Not the jerk. The man is supposed to pay, huh? Yeah, we used to be proud to do things like that. But that was back when we were the heads of the households and we were able to lead our families the way God instructed us to. These days, at least here in America, attempting to lead your family down a righteous path will only result in you divorced, paying alimony, child support, and endless therapy bills for your kids. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Just when I start gaining a bit of faith in humanity, these stories make me lose it again. Am I the jerk for refusing to give my son's free room to my cousin who's living with us? Me, 36 male, and my partner, 38 male, have two kids, Luke who's 18 and Jay who's 15. Some background info. We took the boys under our care when they were 8 and 11. Before they came with us, they had been in different families and group homes for over a year. It was hard for Luke to understand that they were with us for good and that he had his own room and family. Me and my partner knew that he still sometimes has insecurities about it and a recent one was about him leaving for college. We explained to Luke that even if he was 18 and leaving the house, he would still have a room and a place at home, be it now or in 10 to 25 years. That he would still be our kid even when he's 40 and we will always be here for him. Now the issue. My cousin, who's 42, recently broke up and needed somewhere to live for her two boys, who are 16 and 12. Me and my partner have a house that's big enough and we agreed to host them free of charge for six months until she gets her bearings back. For the house, me and my partner have a kind of master bedroom with our bedroom, bathroom, and office. Our boys have their own room and they share a bathroom and my cousin's boys have the guest room with a bathroom. My cousin has a room on the ground floor. It's not big, but she has a space for her bed, a desk, and a wardrobe. Last week, we got the keys for Luke's flat and we started the process of furnishing it. He will officially move in next week and will start uni the week after. This weekend, my cousin asked when Luke's room will be empty. I told her that it will not be, that he will only take his clothes, books, decorative items, basically his room will stay the same and he will only take what he needs. She then asked how she will be able to move in the room with all his stuff still there. I told her that she won't, that it will still be his room. He will still come home on some weekends and holidays. She then complained about the fact that she was living in a storage room, that she was the only one without her own bathroom and that it was unfair of us to have an empty bedroom in our house and not give it to her. Me and my partner were very firm in our decision, but my mom and aunt called me and told me that it was a bit unfair of us to not offer proper accommodation for my cousin and that Luke could do without a room for a few months now that he has his flat for the school year. I disagree. For me, it's more than a bedroom. It's what it represents. It's his own place for him in our home and it's something I want him to have for as long as possible. I've been called selfish and that I was coddling him too much over this, so I would like outsider perspective. Not the jerk. You're a better man than I. As soon as she started involving other family members, I would have told her to pack her crap up and get out of my house. The boys would be welcome to stay if she chooses. They didn't do anything wrong, but mom's gotta go. You have been more than accommodating. Not the jerk. Your cousin is being ungrateful and entitled. She's getting a place for her and her kids rent-free for six months. It's much more important for your son to keep his room than for her to have a big room. She can have the big room when she's paying for it. Shut down this conversation once and for all. You didn't promise this room to her and make sure she knows that. Well, what do you think? Should OP let his cousin have the room or not? Please let us know. Life tip. Never let anyone move in with you, family or not. I've just told my wife, who scares me, that I want a divorce. I'm not sure how I let it get this bad. I, 40, male, just told my wife, who's 43, this week that I want a divorce and I'm buzzing with pride and happiness. We've been together 12 years and have two sons who are 6 and 2. When we met, all was well. We had jobs in the same industry and we traveled a lot. But very quickly, it became clear that my wife doesn't have any tolerance or even understanding for things that are not done the way she wants them to be. She idolizes her childhood and is very close to her mother and sister. Admittedly, she grew up in a very close, large family and had a pretty great childhood. But as an adult, this has morphed into a fanaticism with things being done normally. To her, normally means the way she would do them or how her mother did them. Ironically, her mom is super chill and not at all like her. Over the years, this annoyed me, but it became way worse once our kids were born. Everything had to be done as she wanted it in the house. I couldn't choose how to dress them because I didn't pick the right blend of colors. If I packed lunch and snacks for school, she would change the snacks to the ones that she wanted. That was still the short end of the wedge. The major issue is I wake up early in the morning, 5.30 a.m. I always have and I love it. 
I also do fine at night on little sleep, whereas my wife is a demon if she doesn't get 8 hours. That means that I take care of 99% of kids waking up at night. I do 99% of morning prep, lunch boxes, breakfast, getting dressed, for which she chooses the clothes the night before. I always take the kids to school. Another reason I do this early is that if I do it when she's awake, I get criticized for using the wrong spoon to serve the food or using the wrong milk for oatmeal or not cleaning up every tiny spill the second it happens or using the wrong dish rag, etc. Every criticism is exasperated and aggressive. She's right on some of them, but it's a constant barrage, so I tune her out. I've even been told going to the bathroom is a problem because they feel me being awake. The issue is that our oldest loves to wake up early with me. It's a really cool time for us. We have breakfast, we watch the news, we talk about nerdy stuff. But she won't have it. She insists he has to stay in bed until 6.30. I wouldn't mind, but it's hard for him. He hates it. He cries and moans and whines and just wants to be up and about. I'm exactly the same. Now that our second is doing the same, she has begun blowing up at me aggressively. The other day, she woke up at 6 and accused me of just putting them in front of the TV in the morning and that our eldest is short because he doesn't sleep enough. They get one hour of TV during the holidays and I come up with the vast majority of outing ideas. He's quite short for his age group, but nothing out of the ordinary. And I finally snapped. I was getting yelled at again in front of both of the kids. I just said enough. I calmly said I wanted a divorce and that she would never speak to me like that again. We're away from the house until next week, but I already contacted a lawyer. I'm so happy. It will suck in the short term and then be such a relief. I can't wait to have my own place and the kids on my own half of the time. Her response. So this happened while we were on holiday at her family's in Portugal. Because we're here and she's surrounded by her people, she hasn't blown up yet. She's been distant. We're sleeping in different rooms, but nothing major. When we go home next week and she realizes I'm committed to what I'm doing, oh boy, it's going to crack a toe for sure. Prior discussions and counseling. A lot of people are asking about this. I did try to confront her about her behavior. I tried calmly when I was feeling good to explain to her how I felt. She literally told me, my issues are more important than yours. I tried angrily when I had enough. It turned into a war of words. I tried sadly when I was at my wit's end. She didn't care. Therapy. We went to therapy a few times together and each wrote a list of things for the other to work on. She wanted me to learn how to cook and work out. I now do 70% of the cooking since two years and I play paddle three to four times a week. I asked her to learn to compromise and tidy the house more. None of that ever happened. She always said she had no time to tidy because of her job and the two kids. Funny how I found the time. I also went to therapy alone and worked a lot on building up my confidence, standing up for myself, and setting boundaries. I'm sorry, OP, but let me tell you, as someone who came from a dysfunctional family with a mother that went off on my dad for more than 30 years, I wished my parents had divorced sooner. It's better to have two separate parents, but with good co-parenting skills, than two living together in a house like this. I walked on eggshells with my mother, and soon enough, my brother became the same narcissistic image of her. Am I the jerk for wanting to keep an expensive birthday gift that makes my boyfriend uncomfortable? I, female, just turned 25, have a friend, Logan, who's 25, and we've been friends since we were 7 to 8 years old. I have a boyfriend, Matt, who I've been dating for 7 months. My birthday was last week and I had a dinner party for some friends before we all went out to a club. There were eight of us, including Logan and Matt. We had a little bit of a gift opening before dessert and Logan gifted me an old copy of The Great Gatsby. The book has a special significance to us because for many years, Logan and I lived in different countries. We kept in contact, but we didn't see each other in person for about four years. We finally got our parents to agree for me to fly to his country to visit in 2013. We were talking about what we were going to do on the visit and I really wanted to go and see The Great Gatsby Movie, which had just come out, as it's my favorite book. Logan had never even heard of it and I said he had to read it before we went to see the movie. Logan was never academic and to this day, it's the only fiction book he's ever read all the way through. Whenever I ask him to do me a favor, he always replies with, I read The Great Gatsby for you, so I may as well, and it's a running joke. We always go big on birthdays, but this book means so much to me. The day after, Matt said he felt the book was an inappropriate gift because of how expensive it is. I tried to explain to him that it's just a sentimental gift and that the cost isn't the point, but Matt said he feels weird that another man gifted me something that costs more than his car. This argument went on for a long time and Matt said that he thinks I should return the book 
and if it means so much to both of us, then Logan can keep it. I told him to grow up. We've been having this fight on and off for a week. Matt's saying that it's reasonable for him to be uncomfortable, but I think he's just being a jealous kid. It's not like Logan gave me a great diamond necklace just to show off. He gave me something heartfelt that means the world to me, and I think that should be more important than the fact that Matt thinks it's outside what he deems as an acceptable budget. My mother is saying to give Matt the benefit of the doubt and maybe ask Logan to keep the book for now, and if one day Matt is more secure, I can take it back. My dad is saying Matt's an idiot. My girlfriends are split. This argument is just dragging on and on, and I'm leaving for my birthday trip tomorrow, and I just need some perspective on whether I'm being unreasonable wanting to keep the book. Edit. For everyone asking about the book, it's a 1925 edition, well known to be fairly rare. For everyone asking why I'm not dating Logan, or why I never did, I explain this in detail in several comments, but this is the most comprehensive and reflective answer. It's not that I don't absolutely adore Logan, I do. He's my favorite person in the whole world. But if you ask me why I'm not in a relationship with him, I don't have a concrete answer, because there's nothing about him I don't like, but it just never happened, and I think he would say the same thing. When I think of the way he was with his ex and the ones I've had, including Matt, I don't see us being that way or those people for each other. Update. So, Matt and I broke up. He didn't end up coming on my birthday trip, but we were kind of talking on and off, and he sent me a text that dropped the L-bomb, and I didn't respond in kind. That was the last straw for him. Now that I think about it, that was the next hurdle that was coming. This just brought it forward, I guess. He'll be picking his things up over the weekend. I would like us to stay friends. I still like him so much, but I know that's not really up to me now. I told my mom about the breakup and she apologized for making me feel like I was in the wrong about keeping the book. She said she was just so used to seeing me treat men as disposable and because I had been with Matt so long, she thought maybe he might not be and she got too caught up in that. I think hearing that I wasn't even ready to say I love him was a shock to her and she realized she had been telling herself a story about him and me that wasn't what was playing out. On to me and Logan. Obviously, a whole wealth of opinions and advice was shared about our friendship and honestly, going through the comments on the post was the first time I'd really ever thought that deeply about it. It brought up a lot of memories and feelings, and I did end up talking to Logan about it and telling him about the original post. I ended up making a note of some of the people's questions and asking him. I really wish I could include all of his answers here because I think his responses were pretty funny. Logan did not buy the book as a way to express romantic interest, and the plot was not relevant to his choice to purchase it. Logan has never wanted to date me. Feelings are complicated. I think that's everything. Thank you to everyone who responded. I laughed, I cried, I had an existential crisis. It was a wild ride. I feel like some context is missing that was in OP's comments. She and Logan are rich. Matt is middle class. The book is a 1925 copy with paperwork and she considers it the same amount as spending money on an upscale restaurant or buying a car. She wouldn't answer comments about if Logan asked her out if she would date him after the initial shock citing that she could speculate all she wanted, but it wouldn't matter because he wasn't going to ask her, though she very much denied they had feelings for each other and that Logan wouldn't confess after all these years. She's moved cities and followed Logan to college, including annoying her dad into driving five hours to support him at a career event. She and Logan also bonded heavily after both their partners divorced and Logan was previously in a four-year-long relationship that didn't work out. OP felt Matt was being too controlling over this event, and that if she conceded to this, Matt would ask her to give up other things or ask her to stop hanging out with Logan. She doesn't think Matt needs to trust Logan as long as he can trust her. She also answered comments asking if her relationship with Logan was normal for friendship with very mixed responses and did admit she could get behind the idea of her and Logan being codependent. And Logan also regularly pays for her to go on vacation. She also said she couldn't imagine her and Logan dating since they already knew everything about each other and she viewed dating as getting to know someone. She said she didn't know what they would talk about on dates, but never admitted if she wanted to date Logan or not if he asked. Also, Matt is the first boyfriend she's had long enough to celebrate her birthday with, and Logan is somewhat territorial. I believe she also mentioned how even though it wasn't a competition, she's known Logan longer, and therefore he would always be more important and special, whereas boyfriends come and go, and she would feel the same about any partner with a childhood best friend. That kind of blew my mind a bit. Her mom is 100% right in that she treats men as disposable. She flat out says she does by admitting what you said. To each their own, but I absolutely would not want to be with someone who's always going to consider me second to someone else and whose idea of partnership isn't, we're in this together, but, oh well, partnerships come and go. 
She should stick to casual dating if that's going to be her attitude. Yeah, she dated Matt for seven months, but still didn't feel all that attached to him. Seven months, and she still wasn't ready to even say she loved him. But the guy he doesn't have to worry about is like a sweater that's amazing and beautiful and perfect, but she just doesn't wear. Jeez. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend? Please let us know. Love triangles, not even once. Am I the jerk for telling my sister that she knew what she was getting into when she settled for my cast-off ex? If you had told me years ago that I would be in this situation, I would have laughed, but here we go. My boyfriend suggested that I get an outside perspective here. I, 26 female, was dating James, male 26, for most of college and we had plans to get engaged after graduation. Two months before graduation, I caught him planning to cheat. Nothing physical seemed to have happened yet, but he and another girl were making plans for a weekend that he told me he was going for a quick visit home. Cheating is an instant deal breaker to me, so it was over. Instead of having a fight, I didn't say anything, just waited till after he left for home, texted him proof that I had caught him, and good thing you're single now, have fun, then blocked him on everything and went for a girl's weekend with friends. James lost his mind and spent a month trying to get in contact with me or guilt friends into helping him. The few messages that got through, I trashed without even reading them. After a while, I thought he had finally given up. About a year later, my sister, 24 female, announces she wants to bring her boyfriend home to meet the family. We didn't realize she had a boyfriend, but my parents had a barbecue and told her to bring him. It was James. My parents were stunned but tried to pull it together. I just left. My sister called and tried to explain later that they had met at a party on campus and it was no big deal since I broke up with him. I told her I thought she could do better, but she could make her own mistakes. I just wouldn't be spending time around them. She got mad about it because our parents took my side. I don't get along with my sister at the best of times, so avoiding them wasn't hard except on holidays. My parents caved and let him come to Thanksgiving and Christmas since they seemed serious. James seemed way too invested in getting back on my good side when he was around and it apparently made my sister jealous because she started acting brattier than normal. This last weekend was a milestone birthday for my mom and I thought it would be a good chance to introduce them to my boyfriend, Todd, who's 29. Mom gave it the okay and Todd actually made a great impression on the family. James was there with my sister and he was upset and left early. My sister called me later and yelled at me for upsetting James and trying to make him jealous to get his attention. I told her that she knew she was getting a cheat when she decided to date him and he was no longer my problem. Since then, she's blown up social media, venting about it and is refusing to see my parents for the holidays if Todd and I are there. My parents think she's over the top and acting out, but she's on their case so much they want to try and smooth it over and me apologize for what I said, but I think it was an apt description. Not the jerk. You can choose your friends and your boyfriends, but you can't choose your family. The sister and James are a perfect match for each other. Not the jerk. It almost appears that James is dating your sister to get back at you, and she is blissfully ignorant of that fact. Not the jerk. Your sister refuses to accept that not only did she get your cast off, he's also not worth the drama and issues this has brought to the family. If she's angry at you instead of him because he got jealous, then she's being ridiculous, and apologizing for it isn't going to make her see sense. Am I the jerk for buying my grandparents' house and doing my family out of their inheritance? So I, 28 male, used to take care of both my grandparents from the time I was roughly 19. My grandparents' health started to go downhill and none of my seven uncles or my mom really wanted to help out much, so I ended up moving back in with them to help out as much as I could. My grandpa was in a wheelchair and my grandma had just gone into remission from cancer. Around 2020, when lockdown started to become a serious concern, my grandma was seriously wondering what would happen if her and my grandpa passed because they would not be able to live in their house that they had owned since around the mid-1960s. It is, according to my grandma, an old governor's mansion from the 1800s. It has 10 bedrooms, 5 bathrooms on 15 acres of land. When they bought it, it needed a ton of work and they have spent the last 60 years making it a wonderful home and both wanted to pass there in that house since they had raised all their kids there and even some of the grandkids. It's a family hub and everyone has grown up there. After one bad health scare with my grandpa, my grandma realized that if she lost him, she would no longer be able to afford the house with losing half of her income. So I offered to buy the house from them. I have a fairly high paying job for my area and because I had been living there rent free while taking care of them, I had quite a large savings. Originally I told her I would just give her the money or help her out but she didn't want charity, so she and my grandpa sold me the house for $90,000. dollars 
roughly 10% of the property's value, and I would let her live there until she passed, which of course I would, because they knew I would keep the house and the family, and most of my uncles and my mom just wanted to sell it off for a quick buck. Only one uncle, Josh, knew about them selling me the house and didn't mind at all because me and him had almost exclusively done all the maintenance or the housework over the years. Unfortunately, my grandpa passed in April 2021, and after that, my grandma's youngest sister moved in to spend time with her because they were both widows and could emotionally support each other. So I took advantage of lockdown interest rates and bought another house about 10 minutes away so I could still be close by if she needed anything, but have my own freedom. Sadly, last week, my grandma passed, and after the funeral, the whole family gathered for her will reading. My uncles all got nice items. My uncle Josh got my grandpa's old Ford pickup. My mom got all of my grandma's jewelry. I got nothing, because I already got the house. The reading ended. All of my relatives were confused about the house and asked the lawyer to which she said the house was already sold. Well, it didn't take long for them to put two and two together, and I'm now getting harassed by most of my family, saying I did them over. They needed the money from the sale of the house, and some have even threatened to sue me if I don't sell the house and give them their rightful inheritance. So, am I the jerk for doing them out of their inheritance? Update. I ended up talking to my Uncle Josh about what was going on with the other family members and the harassment over the house. And at about 8 o'clock tonight, he called everyone in the area and told them all to come to his house as the oldest brother for a family meeting. Everyone complied. When I arrived, a couple of my uncles had some choice words, but Josh told them to just shut up, went into his room, and brought out my grandparents' original will before the most recent one that they had left with him. In the will, it stated that he would inherit the house 100%, and the reason was because of all the work he had done to it. Over the years, he had put in a pool, fixed the cracking foundation, replaced the roof, and so much more, and that my grandparents had involved him in the sale to make sure that he was okay with not getting the house. He had told them that he didn't want a big house to take care of, and with him retiring soon, he wanted to take his money and travel and not worry about what was happening to their house. This basically squashed any complaints. So this has been a roller coaster of a day, but thank you everyone for the kind words. I'm ready for a nice drink. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.